All right. Good evening, guys. Welcome to Science of Diving. As we've gone through, we've agreed that everybody's okay with being recorded. Um, we'll be we'll be going through, and if you have any questions, by all means, um, I do not mute you. You mute yourself, um, unless you're loud, then I might mute you. By the way, on housekeeping terms, if I can't see your bright shining face, I will ask you lots more questions. So as long as I can see you and I can I can get the idea that you're probably paying attention, um, you won't get as many questions. Um, but um, Josh will attest that. Those who I can't see get lots and lots and lots of questions, so they turn their camera back on. So I don't care. Turn your camera off. You will answer lots of questions. No skin off my nose, so um, part of that deal. So today we're going to be going through science of diving. This is one of my favorite um, subjects to teach. Uh, my qualifications to this, I've taken science of diving. I am an instructor in science of diving. Um, I'm also a uh, certified instructor in decompression diving as well as extended range, and I'm an assistant instructor trainer with SSI. Um, so those are kind of my um, my criteria in a nutshell. Tonight we've got uh, four students, Caleb, Chase, uh, Josh, and Mike. Oh, actually, we have five students. And Brian, nobody is not a student today except for Nikki and I. So we're not the students. You guys are, but we'll go through this together. Now, just kind of a couple uh, quick things. This is the final piece of um, if getting towards Master Diver um, and one of the hardest pieces of the Master Diver Challenge to get. Now, the advantage to doing this, if you got certified this year with SSI and you get to the Master Diver uh, level, they enter you into a liveaboard, seven-day liveaboard contest with airfare and, and alcohol and everything else that you could possibly hope for for seven days. It's an aggressor three. Very sweet deal. So this is the hardest of the specialties that you'll get overall. Um, as you guys all know, um, we have the, the Dive Pirate Master Challenge um, as well, and the requirements uh, for completion that you have to have science of diving. Um, you have to have the React right, uh, CPR, AED, o, O2, first aid. A lot of uh, Some of you have that, some of you don't. Diver stress and rescue, that, a bunch of you are taking that. Some of us have already gone through that, like Josh. Um, you have to have logged 50 open water dives and a minimum of 10 skills dives with instructor and or an approved dive master beyond this course specialty. So you guys are getting there as well. Suggested specialties, navigation. Um, deep diving and night limited visits. And some of you are doing that this weekend with me. Now, once you get to the master diver, I encourage and I teach a, a course called independent diver or solo diver is it uh, for slang. It's one of my favorite courses to teach. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of fun. I don't know about you, um, but my job is to teach you how to um, deal through being overtasked, overloaded and uh, um, overwhelmed in skills and how to be a resource diver. Yes, ma'am. Doesn't the dive shop combine React Right and uh, the Stress and Rescue class? They do, as a matter of fact, and they'll be doing that as well. And so um, I'm not sure who's teaching React Right, but I've suggested that Aaron teach that, and he is an EMT, and he teaches it a marvelous React Right course. So if you're taking that, um, it's a fun, fun course. Every instructor teaches it a little bit differently, so there is no way to cheat your way through it. And honestly... Um, it was stress and rescue. I come up with new ways to torture you every single time. Same thing with independent diver. Um, you can talk to my previous students and they may or may not give you tips to get through it and survive, but they may be wrong. I may have come up with new fun and overwhelming games. Like, like we say in the Marine Corps, I'm better than Milton Bradley. I have more games. Um, so that's kind of what we got for you guys today. Um, overall in this magical uh, cavalcade of values, um, as we go through this process, I'm going to ask each of you, whether you like it or not, to present one topic topic that's going to be assigned by me. Um, and I'm going to grade you on a criteria uh, based on SSI. Now, Mike, you're not an SSI guy, but um, I think you've got some patty stuff, but uh, the rest of everybody is uh, pretty hardcore SSI. This is the criteria we look for, and I will email everybody this criteria sheet um, in the, in the, uh, at the end of this class so that you have it and you understand what I'm basically looking for. It's pretty straightforward. Um, define an objective in measurable terms. When you present to me, I want you to define what you're going to teach me and measure it. I'm going to be able to, at the end of this, you're going to be able to add one plus one and two plus two. Um, at, you're going to explain the value of that topic. Understanding how to add one plus one and two plus two is very valuable because every once in a while you're going to have to add, um, how many apples Johnny gave you. Um, and at the end of uh, that, the opening, you're going to need to provide an overview of the main topics um, outlined. At the end of this, I'm going to teach you how to do uh, one plus one and two plus two. We're going to use apples, oranges, uh, sponges, whatever. Um, I'm going to grade you on your knowledge and skill of practical application. Um, I want you to talk about equipment throughout this process. 
um, experience promoted continuing education. Why should I continue my education through this process? I want you to give me a safe and accurate information on the topic. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want you to complete the information in a logical sequence. Please don't talk about adding, dividing um, nine, nine by nine if we haven't got through one plus one. Um, delivered environmental safe diving practices in your process. I want you to talk to me about something that is safe or environmentally sound. Um, for example, if we're talking about buoyancy, don't crash the reef. It hurts the reef. It hurts you. It hurts the animals. Um, it doesn't make it pretty for everybody else. Um, I'd like you to use a training aid. Um, you can use PowerPoint. I don't care, honestly, at the end, if you if you guys um, aren't computer super savvy and you guys put together a piece of paper and you – Gosh, I wait. And you showed me something on a piece of paper. I would be okay with that. So um, I'm I'm cool with um, old school techniques. Um, and I realize that not everybody is super t savvy like I am, and or at least like I appear to be. Um, let's see. Motivated class participation. I'm going to require you guys to ask questions of the class. And ask questions to evaluate the student's knowledge. I need you guys to understand and ask questions to make sure. And at the end, it's simple enough. Restate the main points, restate the objectives, and restate the value. And then I'll judge you. Did you accomplish the objective? Did you act, use accurate terms and uh, speaking ability? And did you use effective uh, length of time? Here's the good news. I know the subject. I'm trying to prove that you know the subject. And no better, better way to prove that you know a subject than to teach a subject. Um, so I believe firmly in the teach, uh, show me, teach me, show me, right? Kind of method. And that's what we got to, we use that a fair amount. Um, so I'm only looking for you guys to present a topic of five to seven minutes. It, I'm not looking for a whole class. I'm not looking for 45 minutes. Five to seven minutes is all I'm looking for. And just, I need you to cover the subject so that everybody else in the class gets an understanding and that I can prove that you know the, the information as well. So if you wouldn't mind. Good news, guys. Here are some subjects now um, that you guys can fight over. Now, here's the secret. Take a look at them. And first one to speak up gets to choose. So who wants to take the first uh, to take whatever they want? Guys? You're going to have to mute yourself just so you know. Sure. Are you going to show us the subjects? or? Oh, I'm sorry. I, that's <laughs> There we go. Sorry, subjects. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> do Archimedes. Who's doing Archimedes? I'll do it. I'll take saturation. Okay, who spoke up and said me for Archimedes, but real quick. That was Mike. Mike. All right. I think your people should turn different color when they're speaking or something. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. When you tell me who it is, just say your name for what, what was the next subject? I'll do saturation, Ben. All right. I know Chase has been studying on that. Chase. Nope, that's, that's Josh. Oh, Chase can have it if he wants. I don't care. No, nope. Chase will do DCS. Gosh. Chase. Yeah, I only appear to be technically savvy, guys. You got to give me a break here. All right. I've got some more. I'll take Dalton's law and Henry's law. That's Brian. Brian for Henry's law. One of my favorites. I'll take the temperature effects of underwater environments. And who was that for temperature? Uh, that was for Kim. Yep. Swap the IMA. Just you. you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Who was the uh, temperature environments, Caleb? For Caleb. Yep. There we go. <laughs> There we go. All right. Would anybody like a second one? Or I could, I will take HE, subcutaneous I'll emphysema. Take, I'll take it. Go ahead. Somebody wants it? Chase. Chase. That is, oddly enough, that is one absolutely one of my favorites. I love uh, dive maladies and scaring the crap out of We go a lot more intensive on this as well. So fantastic. Uh, does anybody need to write down their subject? <laughs> But anybody need to write them down? Perfect. All right. Yeah. Back to our presentation. Well, welcome to night one of Science of Diving. Uh, last housekeeping item um, is when would we like to do the next classes? I'd like to do this as a group. 
um, to get an idea when you guys are available. So um, time's available. I have Wednesday the 27th available for you guys if you guys would like it. I'm free. Have I got a heads yep, up on everybody the same for that? time as today, I'm free. Yeah, I'm okay. free. Three? Joshua? You're muted. There's four? Yeah, I'm good. Sorry, I was nodding. We should figure out how to do a poll. All right, so diving. So the 27th, 6.30 again to 8.30, and I will send that out to everybody. More options in just a moment. Why is it green? That's interesting. I've never seen green before. There we go. Save. And I will make sure to send that out to everybody. All right. For class number three, let's take a look here. Friday is obviously not available. Um, uh, Monday is available. Monday the 2nd. I will be working remotely from the Metropolitan of Boise. So if we could just do a little bit uh, later, if you wouldn't mind terribly. Could we do 7 o'clock on? Oh, no, I cannot do Monday. I'm diving on Monday. So Monday, Tuesday are unavailable. So I could do Friday the 6th. Would that work for everybody? Yeah, that should work. Yep, that works for Chase. There's two. Yeah. I am checking. Three. I believe I can make it work. I found out today that I'm going to have to be in India next week for work, but I believe I can make that time. Which Friday was uh, it? The Friday the 6th of October. Yeah, sure, I can make that. All right, Friday the 6th. I'll do 6.30 again on that day. What am I? That's interesting. Uh, so D. Okay, we'll do 6.32. Nine, save. And we need one more. Let's see. Da, da, da. I am no longer in Boise on that day. So that's Friday the 6th. How about Monday the ninth. I can do that. All right. I SOD, Monday the ninth. Everybody good to go? Yeah. Yep. You good? Good. All right. Science of diving, more options. And I haven't added the yeah, attendees, but I will be remote, right? They'll all be time. remote, yeah. Okay. Unless you have some weird desire to come sit in, in the background in my chair. I've had students do that, come sit in my house and um <laughs> sit behind me so you're welcome to do that as well but it's pretty infrequent okay i'm gonna close that up fantastic all right so let's just jump right into it guys what are physics physics is the study of the relationship between energy and matter okay who else has got one for me you could call it the study of, of motion of objects um then you could also call it to, you know, the study of uh, um, electricity and motion as well. Okay. And one of the things that it's, it's a study of the quantification of precise science, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's absolutely the study of characteristics. Chase was exactly right. That's straight from the intro to science of diving. But I think the next piece of it as well is it's also the quantification of it as well. And the qualifications as uh, of that, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. No, I don't think. I don't want any more of your devil cures, woman. No. So, <laughs> so uh, it's the qualification and quantification of precise science, right? Um, the characteristics and interactions of how matter and energy. So we, we have to qualify and quantify things to make them exact. So one of the things I want you guys, as we go through this, it's very intimidating. There's a few of us in here that are really digging the hole. We're going to get into some hardcore algebra and physics and trigonometry and Calculus, we're not really. Um, don't let the math intimidate you. Physics is simply a scientific way to explain divers' experience of an everyday dive. Okay? The reality is that divers are armed with all they know in order to do these calculations. So you've already got the information that you need. Now, being able to make these calculations by hand is very important for developing a sense of the uh, intuition about the numbers in diving. Uh, so it gives you the idea of, Am I doing this right? Am I doing this wrong? Um, and it gives you, once you understand the physics and the math behind it, you'll start being able to put a, an idea, wait a minute, if I'm at 120 feet for 35 minutes, 
intuitively, I should be able to say, whoa, no, that's not right, right? So that's one of the things we're looking for here is we're starting to give you that intuitive idea of what's right and wrong and give you a deeper understanding of that. It's kind of like what we study dive tables in open water. I'm not expecting you guys to memorize the dive tables that 130 feet on 21% auction that you have five minutes. If you're at 32% nitrox, you have 15 minutes. I don't expect you to memorize that. What I do is expect is for you guys to start having a basic understanding that if I go too deep for too long, bad things happen, right? And then if I if I decide to go down to the to the deck of the Lady Luck um, in the sand at 132 feet and I stay there for 25 minutes, that's probably a bad thing. So that's what we're trying to do is I'm, I'm going to give you all the basic ideas of this and start giving you more an intuitive understanding of how things should work and where they're at. So in more advanced forms of divings, this these skills can literally be survival skills. So now as you get more advanced and you start heading towards that type of diving that I like to do and Nikki likes to do, where we, we grab two, three, four, five tanks at a time, and we're going down and spending three hours, you know, exploring a wreck. Uh, the, the idea of what a safety stop is and what the M value for us is as we get ready to do that ascent literally means the oh shit moment of if I come up now, I will die, right? And and while it may not be that dramatic, it certainly could be a matter of I will be very, very sick. I'll fall on the ground. I'll, I'll hurt all over. I'll have to put on auction, sent over to auction chamber. Good news is, by the way, if you can get to an auction chamber, um, a, 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 a decompression chamber within four and a half hours of a, a DCS hit, did anybody know what the survival rate is of a full recovery? Four and a half hours. We want to take a guess on that one, except Josh, because I know Josh has heard this one before. Isn't it greater than 90%? It's like 92, 95, somewhere around 98. There? Yeah. You have a 98% chance of a full recovery if you can get to a chamber within four and a half hours. Now, that doesn't take into account excessive dives. If you're do, if you're talking, you know, like uh, they're, the guys that just went out and, um, last year and did um, that cave in New Zealand that was 806 feet on a rebreather with 32 minutes down and 16 hours back. Now, if they'd come back up, um, you know, really quickly in, in the matter of 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes and uh, without recompressing, absolutely, um, they would uh, uh, have bigger issues and they probably wouldn't survive. Uh, and Mike, if you want to turn your camera off, it's fine by me. Um, I will uh, just take that into account that the camera was having issues. Uh, I'll only ask you about half the questions I normally would. <laughs> and, and it's sometimes it's distracting for other people so does it bother, does it affect me in the least and i don't think anybody else can see you um, oh. i won't keep you guys on the screen very long i can see you but no i don't think anybody else can so <laughs> um so anyway the, the overall idea is is that the basic ideas of of diving start off with open water and the gap and margin for error is very wide it's about 50 percent um of the overall um, safety margin of what you really need, right? You've got to, it's kind of like trying to uh, standing five feet away from a, a pine tree with a, a 12 gauge shotgun and wondering, it, can I hit the shot? Can I hit the tree? You probably can, right? If there's uh, a lot of margin for error when it comes to open water diving, we do that intentionally, right? The overall idea is, is um, we don't need that. But as you start getting into those more complex dives, we're starting to add exotic gases such as helium. Um, into a dive and we're starting really getting into the idea of um, am I do I want to dive try to dive heliotrox or do I want to actually dry this as trimix and um, am I worried about high pressure nervous disorder or whatever I'm doing and worrying about the the transverse uh, or the the, uh, um, the the saturation effect of helium versus nitrogen versus oxygen it really becomes the narrow it becomes a lot narrower and so these really become survival skills but we want you to understand the basics of how to start a fire with a match. And then eventually we'll get to the to the two sticks method, right? So that's where we're going to. Now, if there is an emergency, the ability to intuitively understand the numbers that we're gonna talk about um, is really gonna help you out uh, quite a bit as you start going through that process of understanding, okay, wait a minute, I'm at 130 feet. I've stayed here for seven minutes. Unfortunately, my depth gauge and my SPG um, and my computer or my my computer have died. All I have now is a timing device or a, and a depth gauge. Or even without that, I still ha all I have is just a timing device. I I need to figure out how do I get from point A to point B and what what did that what did that look like?
understandings and under of what that is. Now, there is a saying that goes, unless the num- there is a number, the truth is not known. And now I'm a stats guy. So that's kind of one of the big things for me is um, I have to have a good basis. So Josh and I like to debate this out, or maybe I debate it at him more than I actually debate with him, but um, about the idea that we have to set a base level of with a number that's accurate um, in, in stats, which was my favorite class in college. The idea was junk in, junk out, right? So um, what we're going to try and do to, um, tonight and over the next uh, your next uh, three or four nights with me is we're going to start trying to put an accurate number on the basics of the information so that it, uh, it's more understandable. Now, perfecting the math um, of diving is uh, necessary, but it doesn't need to be intimidating. All this, and there's a lot of complicated crap we're going to go through. Um, it doesn't need to be that big a deal, right? There are charts on this. There are um, easy pieces of math, and I'm going to work hard to dumb the math down so that it, it doesn't need to be, you know, this algorithmic formula of 18 pieces, right? I'm going to try and make it as simple for you as I possibly can so that you've got it. Um, now, for any uh, for any diving math problem, uh, you don't need to really memorize the formulas. So there's only really truthfully <coughs> excuse me at two, your guys's level there's only two formulas you need to you need to have a good understanding of and the great thing is is it's the same formula it's just you're solving a one you're solving for x one you're going to solve for y it really is that easy um they're not complicated um i'll even send them to you if you guys want and i'll, and I'll send you my deck if you guys want me to so don't worry too much about the formulas but there's a couple i would like you guys to have at least a good understanding um with and uh, I'll give you kind of the preview on that. It's how to measure best best blend and how to me- uh, measure mod without having to use a chart. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a dive shop where we've had to we've measured measured our uh, nitrox blend, or I've ordered up nitrox, and I didn't have handy a, a chart to say, okay, we're diving the deck of the Lady Luck, which is 125 feet. Um, I'm going to need 28% nitrox. I simply just did the math real quick. It's not rocket science to do. It said, okay, we want to, we're going to dive 27%. Boom. It's not rocket science to do. Um, or uh, when we get there, we measure it out. And they said, oh, wait a minute, we gave you 26%. So now we know our mod is on that is, and we're able to figure that out fairly quickly. Um, and especially when you get to like third world countries, um, you're going to f- f- come up on dive shops that they've got, well, we've got your 32% nitrox. And you need to have the understanding of, oh, Okay, so uh, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, equivalent narcotic depth. Um, I like to kind of switch, um, give you the idea of of what that means. Um, it's really the same thing as that you guys have been learning in nitrox. It's just the other side of the coin, right? Um, we we talk about the 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 problems with uh, oxygen toxicity, but we don't talk about and we talk about uh, nitrogen narcosis, but we don't talk about equivalent narcotic depth, when does, and start looking at the idea of when does nitrogen become narcotic? When should we be concerned about this? And how do we build a best blend based upon the narcotic ability of nitrogen versus just, I just want to use the, the highest blend of oxygen I possibly can, right? It's not always the best thing to say, hey, I, I can die 40%. I should die 40%. Well, maybe that really isn't the best thing for you, right? So let's, let, we'll take a look at that as well. Um, we're going to take on uh, the problem of diving before putting in the numbers and we're going to understand what it's uh, what is being asked and imagine what uh, would happen in the water. If, if that's okay with you guys. All right. At this point, what questions do you guys have? (coughs) Any questions? So my question for you guys then becomes as we start talking about civic physics, when is a scuba tank empty? When is the cylinder empty? Who's got that? Who wants to chime in on that one for me? When the pressure inside I'll chime the in tank. And I'll say that. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. When the pressure inside the tank equals yeah, the pressure outside. Say, that's what we're all trying to say. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. If you would, uh, instead of raising your hand, if you would, uh, or put your hand in front of the camera. If you want to raise your hand or just say your name uh, to answer the question, we'll, we'll try that. I haven't had that challenge before where everybody had the actually had the answers. I've had, usually had to fight them a little bit. So, Brian, I think you had an answer. What, what was your answer? Um, so that was what uh, I don't know who 
I'll set it, but yeah, when the pressure inside the cylinder is equal to the pressure outside of the cylinder. So that's not good. It's going to vary depending on what depth you're at. Absolutely. One of my favorite stories to tell about this is I was teaching a um, solo diving class and I had a 32. In fact, I had this, this exact cylinder. It is 30 cubic feet of aluminum. Um, I think right now it's got, what has it got? It's got a hundred foot mod on it, which means I need to reanalyze it. I'm not, I haven't taken it out for a dive in a, in a few minutes, but um, it's got a hundred foot mod, which means it's probably got about 50% nitrox in it. Um, I use it as a deco bottle. Um, it's a perfect little deco bottle. But anyway, I was diving it along. That was at 66 feet with a student and we were doing drills and and uh, I was having a, a considerable amount of fun with him and stressing him out and over task loading him. It was a good time for me. I'm not sure how much fun he was having, but I had this on my side and I was breathing it down. And I wanted to breathe it down to zero because I needed to refill it to a different uh, mix. Now, in safety, I had this on my side. I had another regulator right in front of me. So when this one went zero, I could take and put the other regulator in my mouth. So there's my safety uh, conscious message for the minute. Excuse me. <coughs> hmm. Whoa. But at 66 feet, I breathed it to zero and I went ahead and called for in dive, ascend to uh, 15 feet for a three minute safety stop. Okay. I left the regulator in my mouth and I ascended to 15 feet from 66 feet. Magic question for you How many breaths did I get out of that tank on the way up? Uh, Chase, what do you think? About three. Three is about right. It's two and a half, three, right in that area. Interesting enough, on a valve drill, a standard 33-inch hose, 30-inch hose, 33-inch hose itself will get you about a breath and a half, two breaths. Um, Josh, you did a valve drill on a 30-inch 30, uh, 30 hose. How many breaths did you get out of just the hose when you turned the valve off? Mm, I think I got almost two. Yeah. thirty A 30-inch 30 hose that's literally, there you go, half inch around will give you almost two breaths. So as you came up, as I came up on this, I got three breaths out of an empty cylinder. That's, this is one of the reasons that SSI encourages and um, all agencies will tell you, do not drop the regulator out of your mouth if you run out of air and you start an emergency swimming ascent. Because the most likely is, is Boyle's Law, who we, we look at Boyle's Law a lot. We say, oh my God, Boyle's Law, Boyle's Law, it's here to screw me. I, I get less gas out of my tank. But no, no, that's not the case. Boyle's Law can be your best friend in this situation because as I ascended, the ambient pressure around became less. And as the ambient pressure decreased, the volume increased. Make sense, guys? Yep. So that's hey, what Boyle's Law basically states. Yes, sir? I think Mike has a question for you in the chat. I don't think his microphone's working quite right. It's a good thing somebody's moderating the chat. <laughs> Okay, Mike's question is, not sure if my is working, but I had a question about calculations for mod. Is using an app like Deep Tools or Easy Deco acceptable? Absolutely. Um, there are cool apps out there. I have one on my phone as well. Um, I honestly, it may take me a minute or two to find it because I can't tell you the last time I used it. I actually paid for it. Um, I was, one. I've had, I've paid for maybe three apps in my entire life. I'm just not that guy. Dive Planner, there we go. So there's a uh, simple app called Dive Planner. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a simple app and you can um, use it for nitrox. You can use it um, to figure out mods. You can um, figure out dive times. Uh, there's a bunch of really cool, simple apps out there, absolutely. But I can tell you for the most part, um, the math to figure out mod and best blend, the, the formula is so stinking simple that it's really not a, it's not worth spending the four ninety nine or two ninety nine, one ninety nine, twelve ninety. I don't know. I don't remember what I. I think I spent nine ninety nine on that app. It's not worth the nine ninety nine. Your cal your phone comes with a free calculator. Um, you can buy one of these at Walmart for a buck ninety nine or something, right? So, honestly, I, for when it comes to figure out those kind of things, um, I would suggest learning and practicing to do the math on your own. It's stupid easy, <coughs> and it's definitely not rocket science. That is for sure. Um, Nikki doesn't practice very often because I'm a big jerk and I do it for her. Whatever it, your mod on your hundred foot tank is thirty five percent. There you go. Good job. At one point four or one point six. One point four. Okay. There we go. 
if you wanted a 1.6, I could change it, but that would make it 39%. Okay. So there we go. So my mom, um, I, I need to analyze my tank. It, um, it's been sitting in my office here. I need to use it or something and, and blow it off because I need to get it back to 60 to 70%. It's way too low for what I like. Um, and uh, so I've got a, our dive shop owner likes to screw me on my, my deco blends. Um, and uh, so, uh, and fill it to what he thinks I want versus what I actually do want. So. I wish you paint for us. Yeah, maybe you should. Yeah, that's always a good point. So. Um, that is my my thing for the day but anyway doing the calculations is sterilely simple so my next question to you guys is um how about we'll pick on mike because he's got a good camera going here i, I bet you went over to his phone mike I did. if you take sealed scuba cylinder that is empty at sea level and you take it to sixteen thousand feet elevation and open it what's going to happen you'll likely get a little bit of air to flow out Absolutely. At 16,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure is literally 50% of at, uh, sea level. Literally, it's 50%. So why is that? Why, Mike, why are we having air now suddenly coming out of a scuba tank at 16,000 feet that was empty at zero? Because the pressure differential. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, more simply, because of Boyle's Law. Uh, we kick in as pressure decreases, volume increases. As pressure increases, volume decreases. Um, Boyle's Law can be your best friend or your worst nightmare. So um, I like to think of it as my best, um, use the, the physics against themselves and go from there. So when is the scuba cylinder empty? The, your scuba cylinder is empty when the pressure is equal to the absolute pressure. Um, there must be a difference in pressure of air to flow in or out of a scuba cylinder. Your scuba cylinder is considered empty at the surface when the, when the pressure reaches one atmosphere. So take that same empty cylinder to 16,000 feet, which is 50% or half AT, excuse me, if half ATA, open the valve and air is going to flow out. It's because pressure decreases, volume increases until the cylinder is now equalized. And so these are some key points we're kind of throwing in there. Now let's take that example of depth. You take your cylinder um, is empty at 33 feet when your air pressure reaches two atmospheres, equal, uh, equaling the absolute pressure. Um, so if you take and you have an empty cylinder at 33 feet, what happens when you come up to the surface? Will it have air in it? Yes. yes. Absolutely. So just, just keep in mind, this, this is one of the reasons that an out of air ascent, um, every dive inch, wants you to make sure to leave your regulator mouth. And I, I did say that twice. And, and you guys will hear me repeat myself a few times because there's some key important points that I want to make sure that you guys really absorb. Don't kick your regulator out of your mouth on emergency air, uh, air out of air ascent. <coughs> it's easy to do. It's easy to freak out and say, oh, my God, I'm dying. But keep your wits about you. The difference between you and a victim is the attitude that you're going to take into a, any situation. So simple enough, guys. Now, for today's uh, uh, overall um, uh, and uh, our class tonight, we're going to be talking everything in feet seawater. Um, now, just be aware, there is a difference. In one atmosphere of difference, feet fresh water is going to be 34 feet for one atmosphere. Feet seawater is going to be 33 feet. Okay? Now, there's two numbers you'll want to write down because they will be in your test um, at some point. And that's going to be the weight of fresh water exerts is going to be 0.432. And seawater or salt water, exerts 0.445. Now, for those of you who are going to be taking other SSI courses, or NAWI courses, or PADI courses, or SDI courses, or TDI, I think you guys get the point, right? Or GUI courses, I mean, you, any of these courses, INTD, um, any of these courses, you will see those two freaking numbers pop up a fair amount. It is to your advantage right now to memorize 0 0.432, 0 0.445. Just now, to clarify, that's uh, pounds per foot? Pounds per square inch, yep. Per square inch, or is that? Yeah, uh, PSI, PSI per, right. per foot. Yeah, per foot, thank you. PSI per foot, thank you. Having a brain aneurysm. Sorry, the cold is still kicking in a little bit. Now, Joshua, help me understand, why is salt water 0.445 and fresh water is only 0.432? Well, it has more smoke in it, so it's heavier. I like that. I, I, I like the simple answers. Um, 
Josh obviously knows my teaching style. The simpler the answer, the happier Benjamin is. And that's absolutely true. We have salt in, in seawater and we have no salt in freshwater. And as we add stuff to it, it becomes heavier, right? We all know that from carrying the groceries in. Uh, pro tip for you, you learn that a lot when you try to do groceries on a bicycle. Always make sure you even your bags side by side and you put uh, only two uh, on each side and never put the milk on the inside. I tried that one time. It doesn't work. So as you put more stuff in the stupid bags, it weighs more, you know, simple enough. Now, one of the things we need to uh, worry about <coughs> to understand is gauge pressure. Who's got a good definition of gauge pressure for me? Where would I use gauge pressure? How about that, Chase? Where would I use gauge pressure? Not a gauge. <laughs> uh, you you would use a gauge pressure to measure some kind of a container that has a pressure difference relative to your surroundings. But for the for diving, when would I use this gauge uh, gauge pressure? You'll use it on your SPG while you're either underwater or while you're on the surface. So. Sure. Gauge it's primary pressure. for divers information systems. Absolutely. So gauge pressure does not take into account atmospheric pressure. So in other words, the specific pressure being measured does not include atmospheric pressure. The gauge pressure is calibrated to read zero at sea level and measures depth um, in feet seawater. Sorry, there's somebody at Oh, there we go. My son's wife has stopped by. They do not have a washer and dryer, so they stopped by to pick up their laundry that we did for them yesterday. We are those cool parents, right? So I didn't know we could just drop laundry off at your place, Ben. I know, right? It's 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 it's, a, uh, it's an added uh, added benefit service that we uh, provide. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> so we're happy we're happy to do so. We just don't fold and, and fluff, right? You, you, if you drop it off in a box, it comes back in a box. <laughs> <laughs> shoved, shoved in there. So just be aware. So just be aware. Uh, as we kind of go through this, we're, um, oh, uh, excuse me, mm, excuse me. Uh, the depth, the, the gauge is calibrated to read at zero sea level and measures depth in feet seawater. So it's one of the things that you guys need to kind of understand because there's a bunch of freshwater divers around here. So mm -hmm. be aware that there is going to be a difference in most computers and their atmospheric pressure calibrations um, in feet seawater and feet salt water. So just be aware of that. Um, now, the good news is if you have a modern computer such as a Garmin, a Shearwater, um, an Apex, um, I think my my Sunto is somewhere. Uh, I don't know where. My Sunto must be in my bag. Um, uh, uh, any of the modern nice computers, they do have a setting to, that you can switch them over to um, either uh, EN uh, uh, 1396, which is brackish water, fresh water, or salt water. Now, it, what it does is it's recalibrating based upon the type of water. But if you're using a cheap old SPG that give you at, just give you depth, then uh, you will have to realize that it's, it's going to be calibrated just for salt water. So just be aware as you got to go through this. Now, the air pressure gauge will read zero when the cylinder is off and all the air other than the ambient is out of the high pressure hose. Now, cylinder pressure is measured in pounds per square inch or PSIG, or it could be measured in bar. Now, I still use stuff in PSI when I'm around students. If it's just me and I'm doing my calculations, I do everything in bar because metric is stupid easier, especially for gas calculations. I'm just going to tell you that right now. If you're not using bar and meters uh, and liters, um, you are going to get to do three steps of extra math just for fun because you are a dumb American. Um, and I'm a dumb American too, and I still use a lot of that. But just be aware, um, metric when it comes into technical diving will make your life substantially easier. So give me one second. Oh, you're fine. I'm just going to close my door. There ben, happens. you have another comment? I do. There we go. I uh, noticed in some apps computers there is a, yeah, that's EAN, uh, I'm sorry, 13319. Uh, <coughs> uh, and that is your brackish water. Absolutely. There are there are different places. And mostly you find those in Europe um, where, they're, where you have a, a mix between the lake and and the ocean, it's and it's called it's brackish water. It's it's not quite salt, but it's not quite fresh. 
It's a lower level of salt. Now, there are, are also other places, for example, the Red Sea is a great example of that, where the concentrate of salt is higher. So the pressure is greater. So definitely things to take into account. And unfortunately, um, most computers don't have a custom calculation for that. So just be aware um, that you can be slightly off. But the good news is, unless you're doing very, very, very advanced technical diving, being off by a little little bit is not going to be that big a deal, but it's nice to know where you're off. The other things you can do, you can also set your safety margins for a little bit safer. Uh, Mike, that's a great comment, by the way. Thank you for bringing that up. And uh, I always get that number wrong. I, I think I said 1389, but it's 13319. And that is the absolute brackish water. Um, I have not dove brackish water uh, myself. I've only dove salt. So... <coughs> So that's, that's my thing on that. Now, absolute pressure. Let's talk about absolute pressure for a minute. Really, the easiest way to remember absolute pressure is it's the total pressure of everything around us. The term absolute pressure is, though, used to describe the total pressure exerted on an object, such as you, the diver, right? So sitting at the surface, you are experiencing roughly one atmospheric pressure. Now, we're going to pretend throughout this whole class that we are sitting on the beach in Florida, waiting for a Mai Tai to come. Um, uh, we all realize we're, um, we're uh, most of us are sitting in Idaho at uh, 4,800 foot elevation. Some of us are sitting in Northern California at, at uh, California at ele elevation, <coughs> whatever, whatever elevation that might be. Um, I think most Californians are pretty high anyway, but <coughs> come on, Mike, that was a little funny. <laughs> I got it. I'm just slow tonight. Yeah, no worries. But, um, Mike, you have to understand we're all in Idaho and our, the worst thing you can call anybody when you're in Idaho is a Californian. So if you <laughs> want to curse at somebody in Idaho, Idaho you, say, you must be from California. So that, that's how you can tell you, you really screwed up was when somebody calls you a Californian in Idaho. So <laughs> yeah. that aside, I have no issues with California at all. It's a beautiful state with a, a lot of interesting and unique people, land of fruits and nuts I hear. Um, is very so, true. Absolutely. So sitting, so just be aware, sitting at the surface, you are experiencing one atmosphere of the weight of the atmospheric pressure. As you descend, there is an increase in the pressure due to the additional weight of the water or that hydrostatic pressure. Firm definitely to remember. Absolute pressure is the sum of the air, atmospheric pressure plus water, the hydrostatic pressure, creating the absolute pressure. Now, absolute pressure is commonly expressed in bar but it can be pounds per square inch per, fit, per foot. Now, the water hydrostatic pressure increases at a rate of one additional atmosphere for every 33 feet of seawater, 34 feet of fresh water. And the, the formula for determining this is absolute pressure equals depth or uh, feet seawater times 33 feet seawater divided by ATA plus one. Now, remember, in your, as you guys do these formulas um, to figure out different things, there's going to be a lot of either plus one or a minus one. And I want you guys to remember that, that um, don't forget to sub subtract or add the surface atmosphere so through any of your formulas. That's the number one thing that most people forget. So if, I don't know what you need to do. If you need to get yourself a post-it note um, and write on it and put it on your computer, put it on your forehead, wherever you can see it on the mirror for your wife um, in the morning, if you'd like, um, don't forget to add or subtract the, at the surface atmospheric pressure. It is a number one mistake that I see new students in these formulas make as they forget to add or subtract that surface atmosphere. So simple enough. Um, yep. Let's see, he wants me to talk about area. I think we can pretty much get past area, gases related uh, to diving. Let's see, I'm, gonna, I'm skipping a few of the slides, <laughs> but I do work hard to make sure we stay on the slides as well. Um, so I'm staying on topic. I can get off topic very easily. So atmospheric pressure boils law is pressure related to um, uh, volume. So as pressure increases, volume decreases. Now, this is pretty important when it comes to diving. Caleb, talk to me about how would Boyle's law affect the amount of gas I need for a dive at 33 feet versus 99 feet? Uh, as you go deeper, you're going to be consuming more gas. So your 
your consumption rate is going to be higher. Exactly. Why? Well, your exterior pressure is higher at the lower uh, de uh, depth. So you're, as you breathe in, you're just going to have more air volume in your lungs. Absolutely. Very good. Here's how I like to describe it. Um, I went into my, my wife's cupboard and I cut up one of her sponges, much to her mis great dismay. I also replaced it though, just, just so you know that I, it got me out of the doghouse. This is about great, uh, perfect because it, it simulates the idea of say 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, right? So this would be equal to one molecule of the air we're breathing. As we go down to 33 feet, we literally compress and we get the same equivalent of two molecules of the air we're breathing in the same amount of space. As we go to 66 feet, we get the three times the amount of molecules that we're breathing in the same amount of space. So if I go down to 99 feet, I can add one more and it's literally squeezing them all together. So now I've got four molecules of air in the same amount of space. Mm -hmm. Is that a pretty good representation guys? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's yeah. not adding molecules though, right? It's, it's just, not really adding molecules. It's, it's uh, compressing them. You have this compressing them. So you have the same amount, the same amount of molecules, but now these molecules can now ex, um, ex, um, ex, or, uh, ex, exist in the same space as they would before. So now your one cubic foot is equal to six, in, uh, six, in, six cubic inches is equal to three cubic inches is equal to one and a half cubic inches and so on. So we have the same volume we still have the 80 cubic feet right but now it's equal to 40 cubic feet or 30 cubic feet or 25 and so on so we we're because of that because there's the the gas is being compressed and it's it, more gas is able to fill the same space we're going through more of it because here's the question brian do yep. our lungs change size from the surface to 130 feet <laughs> yes they do they do are you sure? Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that you're wrong. So I wear a size 12 uh, shoe. Um, does that mean I wear a size three mm -hmm. at, at 130 feet? Well, no, but you also don't have any bones in your lungs either. So uh, I, I have a 42 inch. So I have a 42 inch chest. Um, do I have a? a uh, 20 inch chest at uh, 66 feet? No. Nope. So the, the volume, the size of my lungs doesn't change. They're still going to be 2.1 liters. And I'll, I'll still be, I'll still need 2.1 liters of something to fill my lungs up and down, right? Now, the problem is, is the amount of gas in my tank is compressed. So that one cubic inch of air at the surface is equal to half a cubic inch of air at 33 feet is equal to a third of a cubic inch of air at 66 feet, a quarter of a cubic inch of air at, at 99 feet, right? I showed my sponges. So overall, so that's the thing is I've got the same amount of space, but I have to fill it with something because it's compressed. That air, that gas is now compressing in. It's taking more of that gas because it's smaller it's being compressed and squished like my sponges right so if at the surface i've got one cubic inch of air right at 33 feet and i've got two cubic uh, uh cubic inches of air in the space of one cubic inch at 66 feet i have three cubic inches of air compressed into one cubic foot of it one cubic inch of air uh, air space so it the air the gas is compressed my lungs are not. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So the, the lungs don't change in size, but what does change is the, the size of the gas molecules. They become compressed and much smaller. So instead of being this size, they're getting into smaller, smaller. So it takes more of them to fill the exact same space. So that's definitely important as we start going into the understanding of what's going on here so as we we get a representation of this together Boyle's law is basically p1 um, times v1 equals p pressure uh, 2 versus volume 2. so the effects of doubling pressure surface uh, is equal to one atmosphere so at 33 feet seawater is equal to two atmospheres so that's two times one equals two 
99 feet seawater is four atmospheres. So that's two times two equals four. And 231 feet seawater is eight. So that's two times four equals eight. So it's P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So basically what's happening is as we're going deeper, things are getting more compressed. Now, so what's the difference between Boyle's Law and Gay-Lussac's Law? Now, if you are so inclined, you are welcome to read through this. Um, but who would like the simpler explanation of Gay-Lussac uh, and Boyle? Anybody? Yes. Absolutely. So a simpler definition. Boyle's Law is the volume directly related to the pressure at a constant temperature. Now, interestingly enough, Boyle did not come up with the concept of at a constant temperature. Um, <coughs> Robert Boyle was a crazy Scottish guy that worked around North Scotland in a kilt, uh, putting snakes into tubes and throwing them off a cliff. Kid you not. Uh, he did that in the 1600s. And what he was doing, he was literally taking and putting in a pressurized, uh, a uh, one atmosphere pressure uh, sealed cylinder. He's putting snakes in. He'd throw them in on a string off a cliff into the water. Then he pulled them back. And he, he had a snake come back up that had a tear in its eye. And he theorized that this idea of pressure and volume. Now, it wasn't for eight more years that uh, Marriott, a French um, physicist, came up with the idea, um, utilizing uh, photosynthesis in plants, came up with the idea at a constant temperature. So every book out there in, in diving, except for the SDI, TDI stuff, um, gives Boyle the, the, uh, the credit for coming up with at a constant temperature. That's horse pucky. That was Marriott. So as pressure increases at a constant temperature, volume decreases. Now, gay set, gay <laughs> is the volume is directly related to temperature. As a gas becomes colder, its volume decreases. Now, that is the big difference. It's we're talking, one of them's talking about the pressure at a constant temperature, one of them's talking about the pressure because of a temperature. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it. A lot more, a lot simpler than it, um, than the, uh, the complicated, uh, <coughs> um, Abiton's law of uh, giving a pressure at a mass gas or varies. Da, 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 da. You, you're welcome to write this down if you'd like. I wouldn't. Um, simple enough, it's just the volume directly related to pressure at a constant temperature, and Gay Lussex re relies on temperature because of pressure. So, as we kind of look and dig into this a little bit, we're going to dig um, and get to give you guys a little bit more some higher concepts here. The idea of bar is pretty straightforward and it affects everything we deal with. So for example, at zero meters, we have one bar. The partial pressure of oxygen is 21%. The partial pressure of nitrogen is 79%, giving a total volume of one or gas density of one, one X. Make sense? Sure. Cool, easy enough. At 10 meters, 33 feet, um, we now go to two bar or two atmospheres. The partial pressure of oxygen now increases to 42%. What we're literally doing is we're going back to that idea of having two, say, air molecules, and we're putting them in the same space and squishing it together because now we've got a lot more pressure. So we go back to our sponge idea. So simple enough, 42%. Now, partial pressure of nitrogen gets to 158%. Our volume of gas is 50% less. So it's half, but the density is two times. So literally we can figure this out very simply. If we, the partial pressure of oxygen is 21% at the surface, we go to 33 feet, we multiply it by two. So the partial pressure we're now breathing is 42%. The same thing continues as we get to 20 feet, 20 meters, three atmospheres, 63% oxygen, 2.37%. Now, anybody have an idea why the, I might have put a yellow to red bar here? Josh, Not, what do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd assume that that's uh, when nitrogen starts become becoming narcotic. Exactly. And like I said, throughout this course, we're going to touch a little bit on equivalent narcotic depth and what that means. And so this is our first kind of introduction into that. Just be aware that once... <laughs> we start getting past that magic 66 feet that nitrogen becomes narcotic. And it's definitely something as we're building our calculations for gas, we want to know where that is at. Where are we going to start getting the fun narcosis, the mistress of the deep? So I want you guys to just kind of be aware that about 66 feet after uh, 2.6 um, partial pressure of nitrogen, 
you start getting a little bit of uh, funky, uh, funky psychedelic going on there. And it's just not as good as it could be. But overall, um, the volume of your tank is now at a third. You're at three times density, 30 meters, four, 40 meters. The maximum depth you guys will be certified to dive at um, is going to be five bar. Partial pressure of oxygen is 1.05, which, by the way, is the first point where oxygen can start creating a mild concern for oxygen toxicity. We will definitely talk about that later on. And we're starting to get into that heavy uh, concern for where nitrogen becomes narcotic. Our volume has gone to one fifth and the density is now five times. Now I'm bringing this up with the density being five times. Brian, what do you think that might do to the breathability or the work, more accurately, the work of breathing if the gas we're breathing is five times denser? It's going to be harder to breathe. Absolutely. When the, when the gas gets too thin or too heavy, it's hard to breathe, right? Like on the submarine, you can't light a lighter because the, the oxygen is too low. The partial pressure is too low, right? Right. You're, you're one of those, uh, those submariner type guys. Um, it's not gay if you're underway, right? Then it's not gay if you're here. So <laughs> you definitely experience the lighter side of that. But on the other side of that is definitely a concern. Now, why is that a concern when the gas density is heavier? Chase, what do you think? Why do you think that might be something we want to be aware of? Uh, because you start using more energy trying to breathe that stuff, and it can get really challenging to breathe. Absolutely. 58% of dive maladies um, are what? Caleb, what do you think? 58% of dive maladies are what? Oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure what the word that you're looking for is overexertion or something basically yeah cardiac related hmm. now here's why um you get joe blow insurance salesman who has been sitting he's now 49 years old and uh, he has been sitting behind his desk doing actuary tables and whatever else insurance salesmen do right that sit at a desk i, I honestly don't know Right. I'm a consultant, so I'm always I'm always uh, talking to people. So very low act activity. Right. He decides my kids are out of the house <coughs> and uh, I no longer uh, have to worry about paying for their college because they're finally out of college. My youngest is 24, for example. My oldest is 31, 53. And so now all of a sudden the magic thing happens is you guys. Um, are all in that younger phase. Joshua, you haven't hit that torturous phase yet. I don't know where you're at, Mike, but kids cost a lot of freaking money. I'm just going to put it out, laid out there. They, they are. The Who's that? <laughs> that was a good one. So kids cost a ton of freaking money. Um, so, but the thing is, once they're out of the house and they're through college, they got to pay for their own crap. And all of a sudden the magic thing happens and money starts reappearing in your wallet. So this magic, this, this guy is 49 years old. He decides he's a little overweight, which is the average American. He's probably 25 pounds overweight and he hasn't walked a mile and uh, other than walking through Walmart to pick up his donuts and Twinkies, um, decides he's going to get dive certified and go to Roatan and do three dives a day to 66 feet. At 66 feet, that's four times the density you have. So each one of those things that dives is equal to probably around a five mile brisk walk. At the end of his five days, 15 dives, he has now dove or done the equivalent of 75 miles of brisk walking over the course of five days. Hmm. Hmm. Exactly, right? What do you think is going to happen to his poor uh, carotid um, uh, arteries and his, uh, his, uh, his heart? It's going to be Good a thing. Bad thing. Diving is a sport. It does take exercise. It does take a certain amount of physical fitness. So 58% of dive maladies are cardiac related. It's one of the reasons Nikki and I carry an AED in our truck with us when we go to any dive, um, as well as a couple of bottles of O. Oh, and of course, as you all are well aware, my suture stapler kit that I'm dying to use one of these days to staple any part of you to any other part of you. But uh, <laughs> We do carry an AED just for that exact reason. We realize the type of guy that's going to go out and get diving is going to be my age. He's going to be an empty nester. Um, he's probably not going to be as, as uh, 
I'm not physically fit by any manner of means, but I'm certainly probably a little bit more physical than most. Um, they're going to be architects and engineers sitting behind desks doing nothing, eating Twinkies and Ding Dongs and chocolate almonds, right? So that's what they're going to be doing. So that's that. be aware that as this gas gets denser, your sac rate is going to go up because of the density as well. That um, as you start going de deeper, not only is the idea that um, – there's going to be less gas in the same amount of space, but because of the density of the gas, it's going to ca cause you to work harder to breathe. So it's the idea is which do I go through um, more air sitting on the couch, watching uh, the amazing race or uh, big bang theory or running the track at uh, Idle Falls high school. Right. Obviously I go through less air gas sitting on the couch. Right. And that's why um, our grandma sit on the, on their couch uh, with the nebulizers. <laughs> Um, and they, they can do that from the whole mix because it doesn't take much to create um, auction for them, right? So just be aware of that. Um, as you're doing this, the exertion, you may not realize it because you think, you know, I tell you that I'm teaching you to do nothing. The idea is, is that that gas is going to be heavier and cause more. Now, here's a magic thing for you, just kind of an off, off the subject, but on the subject as well. One of the interesting things is as you start getting into that 40 meter depth and you start changing over to helium, something magical happens. How, what is the weight of helium by comparison with auction, for example? It's Josh? Lighter. It's yeah, lighter. Lighter, by about four times, right? It's one of, one of the reasons we don't use helium in our dry suits because it, it sucks as an insulated fashion because it's so much lighter and so much thinner. But the other interesting thing about it is, is it, it makes the work of breathing easier. That's one of the one of the reasons why helium is so popular um, and most agencies are, are starting their trimix courses at 100 to 130 feet. Depends on the course. GUI, for example, starts their uh, tech diving um, with trimix at 100 feet. There's absolutely a reason for that because it is safer. Now, interesting factor of that on the other side to be aware of because helium is so much lighter, it has a four times greater saturation factor to be aware of as well. So it'll cause the gases in your tissues to saturate four times faster True. than anything else, than oxygen and nitrogen. But- It'll cause all the gases to saturate it faster does. or just helium? It does, it, yeah. Um, there's a debate on that and there's a lot of argument, but the truth of the matter is, is because it's they're bonded together, it, it allows them to bond faster into the fast and slow tissue. Um, so there, there is, at the high level, there's some debate on that, but, uh, when you talk to the pulmonologist, um, they'll tell you that it really does cause them all to do the same thing, uh, to, to bond faster. So what ends up happening because of that? Now, the interesting thing is, is, um, a helium does not bind, um, like oxygen or carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, um, to hemoglobin, but it does cause a, almost a lubricating factor and causes them all to blend faster. So interesting. It's kind of one of those interesting things, um, but it doesn't bind the same way, but it does reduce the amount of nitrogen and uh, cause them to bind faster, but it makes your work of breathing a lot easier. But the, the downside is as well, because of that, it, it also increases your deco factors. So as you are creating um, a deco factor based upon your trimix blends, you definitely need to be aware that your deco times will increase. So as you're um, creating that idea of what your deco blends are, you're going to have to take into account that because of why, Brian, why would I, why would, why would it, if I'm increasing my deco times, how would that affect my gas consumption needs? So or with planning. that, I mean, if, right. Yeah. If you're going to be doing decompression longer than, you know, you're going to be using more gas. Exactly. Ding, 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 ding. Very good. <laughs> so you're going to need more, more gas. You're going to have to carry more gas. So, you know, there's, there's a, an interesting, when you start to get into to heavy deco diving and, and a lot of this kind of diving, there's a lot of trade-offs and balances that you have to make. Do I want to do helium at this point, or do I want to hold back? Do I want to, to risk nitronarcosis or am I okay? Do I want to, and you start figuring out these balances. And that's one of the reasons we talk about it using the best blend, not the max blend. So, and we've kind of figuring that out. We can certainly use max blend, but you're better off using best blend overall. Interesting enough, guys? Interesting? Not interesting? Keep yeah, going? interesting. Okay. 
All right, so the golden rule of diving, never hold your breath, is tied to Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law basically allows a diver to calculate the pressure that they will experience at any depth and the amount of gas that will be consumed at that depth and how much volume will increase if they ascend from one depth to another. Now, pressure and volume relation tied directly to how pressure acts on a diver as they progress through the dive. Now, Dalton's Law is used to calculate the maximum operating depth, best mix, partial pressure calculations. It's also used for uh, gas blending calculations and how much of each breathing gas a diver absorbs is tied to Dalton's law. Now, diving exposures and decompression theory tied directly to calculations made due to Dalton's law. So, <coughs> I apologize, guys. I'm, I am so sorry about having to cough on you guys all, this, all the time. This is the good thing about remote is I can't give you COVID. <laughs> <laughs> No, no remote COVID. Okay, so now question. Let me get over to my question field here. Knowing that pressure and volume are direct related, how would this affect the amount of gas that you need at a depth of 99 feet versus 33 feet? Mike, what do you think? Um, you're going to need more gas at a depth of 99 feet because it's going to be more dense per breath. That's absolutely right. Now, adding to this, how would this affect a warm water diver versus a cold water diver? Chase, what do you think? There we go. Um, so a warm water diver uh, is uh, going to have more usable volume than a cold water diver because in colder water, you're going to have a higher density gas blend. Absolutely. Yeah, as we talked about earlier, the idea basically goes back to Gay Lussick that um, temperature and volume are directly related. Colder means denser, warmer means more, right? Simple enough. It's definitely not rocket science when we put these together. Now, interestingly enough, there is another law that we're going to get into. It's called Henry's Law, and that's going to talk about cold as well. So just kind of be prepared. We're going to talk about that um, in a moment. Now, what is the volume of usable gas in an 80 cubic foot tank at 33 feet seawater? Uh, Brian, I don't think I picked on you in at least two seconds. <laughs> um, all right. So then that volume, since we're going to just make sure I'm getting my math right. So if we're going down an additional atmosphere, we're going from one bar to two bar effectively. So. That would just be 40 cubic feet of usable gas then, right? Exactly. We have, right? Simple enough. If we were to go to 99 feet, it'd be a quarter of that, right? So 20 cubic feet. Easy enough. Just a few key things to kind of keep in mind. Now, Charles Law. Charles Law, if the pressure of a gas is constant, then the volume of the gas varies directly with the temperature. If the volume of a gas is kept constant, the pressure of the gas varies directly with temperature. So basically, Charles takes the last two laws we just talked about and puts them together. It takes Boyle and Gay Lussac and puts them together into one idea, right? So the practical application of Charles Law, a diver has a flexible container at the surface and he, she, them, I want to make sure we get the pronouns correct, has just taken out his or their diving locker. Um, the temperature at the time is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The volume of the container is initially three cubic feet. The diver sets the container out in the sun on the deck of the boat. Uh, on the way out to the dive site, the temperature climbs to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the final volume of the container? It's going to be substantially more. It's going to be 3.2 cubic uh, feet instead. You can certainly go through this, but the idea is basically that as you leave that scuba cylinder out in the sun, things are going to happen to it. Easy enough. Now, where is this going to be important? Where do you think, uh, what kind of diving might this be super important to be aware of where I start coming into the idea of heat and my scuba cylinder? Cold water diving. Cold water diving is absolutely one of them. Josh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, here you might go from your warm truck to your, to your cold water. Absolutely. Or vice versa if it's in, if you're in Belmont. Absolutely. I, one of my favorite things about Belmont is uh, driving down there is two, two and a half hours roughly, right, Josh? Um, and uh, having my, my cylinders in the back, I, I'll have a hundred cubic foot cylinder in the back. And uh, 
Uh, it'll get down to negative five in the back of my truck for a while with air air temperature. Uh, I can jump in the water. I could put my gear together real quick while it's five degrees outside, jump in the water and calculate my sack rate for the first four minutes of dive and I actually have a negative sack rate. It's amazing. <laughs> I can literally uh, be putting gas back in the tank. I'll start with 3000 PSI at the end of a five minute dive. Um, I'll have 3,100 cubic feet of air or 3,100 PSI of air. It's, it's, it's an amazing amount of fun. <laughs> Another example of this to be aware of. Yes, ma'am. How much of a temperature difference do you think has to be to make that change? Any temperature change uh, is is enough, but if you're at least 10 to 15 degrees, um, you're going to have a significant change. So nope. I'm going deep in our IRE and then coming up to where it's warmer, you can see the same thing. Yeah, you should. Um, you should. Uh, you'll have a variance in temperature if you're going from um, 42 degrees at, at the 120 foot mark in Ryrie Reservoir um, up to the 60 degree mark. You're definitely going to um, experience some of that um, in uh, in variance and, and volume volumetric changes. And so it's one of my issues with uh, most agencies creating their sack rate and saying you should go for a dive at 20 feet for 20 minutes because it, it doesn't take into account temperature at all mm. so it when you put together statistics and you put junk in you're going to get junk out so mm. and we're going to get into that i'm going to talk sack right here in a little while um to make sure that we have a good understanding of that but um i want to make sure that whatever we are doing we're getting a good idea that things matter temperature matters volume matters pressure matters atmosphere matters right another place this is one of the most um common examples of problems where people run into problems is cave diving oddly enough what they'll do is they'll drive out to jenny springs um devil's uh uh, uh devil's breath um uh devil's grotto there's a lot of devils um devil hole out there um blue grotto um Jenny Springs, uh, you know, there's a lot of these out there, right? There's one in New Mexico as well that uh, is a big deal. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Young was telling me about it. Pretty amazing. But anyway, the moral story is they'll drive out to the desert um, in Florida, um, and it's 110 degrees and about 4,000% humidity with this tank in the back where they they did a cave fill on a freaking um, HP 100. And, they, and Josh will tell you that I, I, I'm famous for my 3,700-pound fills on a – 3,500 cubic foot tank or 3,500 uh, or 3,500 PSI tank. But the problem is you do 3,700 pounds in this tank. You put it outside the sun for at 105 degrees. All of a sudden now you got 4,200 PSI of air, right? And so they take their initial say, okay, it's at 4,200 PSI or 4,000 PSI or 3,500 PSI, whatever it is in the sun. They say, okay, I'm going to convert that out. And that's, and uh, 3,500 PSI is going to be 220 bar times the 11.1 liters da, 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 and, and figure out that I have 3,500 liters of air. And for that, I've got a, a, a nine liter a minute sack rate divided, uh, multiplied by depth. So I'm going to be able to do uh, on a 100 cubic foot tank, that should give me one hour and 20 minutes. So if I divide that hour and 20 minutes into thirds, that's, uh, or not, it will say 90 minutes. Uh, that means 30 out, uh, 30 out, 30 back, 30 in reserve. Now here's the problem. I get into jenny springs or devil's grotto devil's hole devil's spit um any of the fun devil names out there there's a ton of them um blue grotto blue grotto i can tell you is is fresh water and they're all the same they're all 72 degrees it's wonderful but you take that and put that in all of a sudden at 72 degrees that 3500 psi is now equal to 3100 psi or 204 bar so we got that 204 bar. We've just now lost 16 bar times 11.1 liters. So 11.1 liters times 16. That's 177 liters of usable gas. If my sack rate is 10 liters per minute, that's 17 minutes that I've just screwed up on my timing into a cave. Is that a little scary? <laughs> just a Absolutely. little. Absolutely. Just, you know, and the good news is, is we're doing, you know, third, we're doing rule of thirds. But what happens if I've got that on four tanks? Mm -hmm. I'm doing, I'm going to Woody's room in Devil's, um, Del Grotto. And Woody's room is lost over an hour. Oh, yeah. And Woody's room is two hours of climbing in and two hours of climbing back. So that's four hours of diving to get in and out. 
I could run into a problem, pretty serious problem. So just be aware that, you know, variance matters. And as we go through this process, we want to make sure that we're taking into account all the factors that are key. I feel like he's so on the sales a... pitch for uh, rebreathers. <laughs> rebreathers are pretty amazing. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the idea is, is that um, you're working off a three liter tank. So the variance for heat and temperature and pressure, it has a lot less effect on that, you know, right? Um, the, the volume of the air is the volume of the air is really from you, not the not from uh, your tank, right? <coughs> the three liters or six liters of air, depending upon the, uh, the tank that you're carrying, um, all it's doing is replenishing the auction back from 16% to 21% or, or to whatever your set point is. You, a lot of guys dive at uh, 1.0 or 1.1 set point for their partial pressure of auction. So they're diving, you know, 1.1. So the idea is it's taking it from 16% back to 110%. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a that's a typical set point for rebreather diving, which is really cool because the overall process reduces the, the need for decompression considerably, um, usually by around a third uh, to a quarter. So rebreather diving um, requires about a quarter, 25% of the uh, typical decompression time. So, and it requires about 400 pounds less. No, just kidding. It's, it's uh, the average rebreather unit, even with uh, two, three liter um, tanks, one of them being auction, one of them being um, helium, um, is usually around the same weight as a single tank 80 or a single tank uh, HV100 tank. So you're diving about the same weight, um, but uh, on a single three liter, you should be able to get around four and a half hours of dive time. So pretty amazing. <laughs> so let's let's jump back into our laws for just a minute. Uh, let me. I wrote this out, and I, and I love this. Um, the, the, there are four laws that we are going to be dealing with over the course of this course. Boyle's law. This is them simply stated. I stated them as simply as I humanly possibly could. Boyle's law is basically pressure volume. So think a balloon going to depth and the outside pressure around it. Charles' law. Uh, is pressure and temperature. So think of a boiling pot, the pressure inside the pot against the lid. That's Charles' law. Gay Lussac, uh, think about uh, volume related to temperature or hot air balloon, um, or think hot air in a balloon more accurately. Uh, this is the expansion of the air or the uh, volume of the air as it expands. Henry's law. Henry's law, we're going to talk more about it. Henry's law is gas dissolved in a liquid. Now think Kool Aid crystals in water. The faster we stir it, the faster it mixes. The more we mix, the more concentrated it becomes. Now, key side note: the key uh, side, to, uh, the side key to this is remember that it mixes and dissolves better in cold water. Now, we talked about that. Why is that important, uh, Chase? We talked about this a little earlier. This is go. This kind of brings back our point. Why is it important to understand that gas mixes faster in cold water? Well, it's going to have an effect on on your uh, your onboarding of gas dissolved gases into your tissues and your fast tissues and your slow tissues, and so it's going to change the way that you may approach your decompression. Absolutely, Brian. How does how is this going to affect my ascent rate in a cold water dive as well as my safety stop? So, with it being the cold cold water, if you are if it's more soluble. Uh, um, especially if you're talking about getting in a slow tissue, um, you're going to have to extend your time because more will have, um, I'm not trying to say, more will have gone in, which means more will have to come out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? So how does that affect my, my, my safety stop and my ascent rate? Uh, so your ascent rate, um, you should probably have a slower ascent rate, and you might want to have your safety stops a little bit longer just to give more time for it to uh, come out of your system. Absolutely. Joshua, what kind of diving do we do around here that Henry's Law might be something we want to understand a little bit more of? Yeah, I mean, we got down to, what, 45 last or a couple days ago? So. Absolutely. Most of the Did we lose them? Ben, did we lose you? Seems like we lost there.
Ben says he lost internet. He'll be right back. Okay. That's Murphy's Law. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't in the material. Where is that one again? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know that the Navy did a study and they looked at decompression sickness in dives that started cold and ended warm and then decompression sickness in dives that started warm and ended cold. And it was a huge study. I mean, they had a ton of participants and unfortunately I can't remember which one's which, but one of them was a magnitude of order higher in the number of decompression uh, uh, sickness occurrences. <coughs> Gentlemen, I am so sorry. I lost internet there for a minute. Apparently, uh, the internet has COVID too. I, I don't know that I have. I don't think I have COVID because I can still smell things. Um, I, I can smell the enchiladas my wife made me tonight. They were pretty awesome. I didn't make you made them. Oh, fair enough. I made the enchiladas, but I was giving her credit. So my wife is very awesome. But anyway, so uh, uh, we were talking. Um, that one of the types of diving that we definitely want to be aware of um, is cold water diving and ice diving. The ice diving really gets even more important to understand the ideas of how Henry's law um, affects the, the type of gases we absorb and how fast they absorb. So we definitely want to make sure we're being a little more careful on that. And it's interesting that, um, and it's kind of, it sounds counterproductive that cold um, will cause gas to absorb into a gas, uh, into a, um, into a liquid faster, but it's because the gas is, is more dense. That's you know, if you want to know the reason. Um, so it's kind of interesting to understand. Um, and let's see, I'm going to share my screen again. And again, I apologize. Hey, Ben. Yes, sir. While you dropped off, I was recalling a study that the Navy did that yeah. uh, they looked at DCS in dives that started cold and ended warm and DCS occurrences in dives that started warm and ended cold. And one of them the occurrence rate was a magnitude of order higher than the other. And I can't remember which one's which. Do you, are, are you familiar with that? Started, I am familiar with that, actually. Um, and uh, this, they did that study in Florida, oddly enough. There is a very, very, very deep cave in Florida um, that some friends of ours <coughs> uh, were actually diving and studying. Um, one of them uh, is a uh, who did my technical instructor training. Um, but interesting enough, the surface temperature of the water was – um, 65 to 67 degrees, and they would have to get down to a diving bell at 85 feet, and they had to switch out of their dry suits to wet suits because as they got deeper, it got warmer. They went to a hot springs, and as they got to the 300 foot mark, it got to 105 degrees. Now the the bigger problem became is there is no algorithmic build um bullman or vgbm or pile or gomer or anybody else out there nobody's built a, an actual model based upon warmer or colder to warmer it's it's just not out there it's not something you see very often the only place i've ever seen it is yellowstone lake uh, my wife and i were diving that we dove uh, the craters a few times um this this summer where we would go out and you'd start down You'd hit about 40 feet and you'd feel that cold as you started into the crater and it would get down to 42 degrees, 41 degrees, and you'd feel it. You're right. You're just this wave of cold. When you hit the thermocline, whoosh, you're like, oh, and, and every time we'd hit it, I'd say, oh, here we go. And the cool thing was, is after you hit, hit that, it would start warming back up because you'd get down to 60, 70 feet and it would get back up to 50 to 60 degrees. And as we were at 72 degrees uh, or 72 to 80 feet, um, it would be around 61 to 62 degrees. So it's an unusual, very, very unusual thing to happen. And because of that, there's not a lot of models. So when you go colder to warmer, um, it screws up the model quite a bit. And uh, having to come up with custom calculations is interesting. They actually ended up um, employing two um, diving PhDs to try and come up with actual models. And it's one of the reasons they developed a diving bell um, and they put the diving bell at 90 feet for them to be able to change out of wetsuits and into dry suits. Um, because originally they were just going to go down wetsuits, brave the cold, and go down. But the problem is that some of their deco was going to be at 60 feet, 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, and colder and colder, which was going to reduce their body's ability to off-gas 
in the same direction. So they found it to be better to start their dive in a dry suit, get to the 90 feet, uh, 90 foot bell, <coughs> um, switch over to wetsuits, and then continue the, the dive as a, a standard deco dive, and then come to, back to the bell, which was their, their first deco point, and switch back into full heated dry suits. Um, and they were using full heated garments because the problem was is they're getting to the back of this bell and they were um, <coughs> stage deco bottles at this point. And it was literally um, a half hour total of dive time down to the um, down to the the primordial ooze, if you will, because um, they they determined that the spring where they were going down, they were seeing artifacts that were literally in the 20 to 50 million year old range. It was super interesting, right? Um, and uh, since then, the state of Florida um, has banned all diving and research there, period. You can't, even the Navy can't go in and research there, but that's a different story. But interestingly enough, once they got back up to the 90 foot uh, mark and they switched over to dry suits, all of a sudden um, it went from, uh, you know, where it could have been, you know, three minutes up of service time, they were literally spending seven to nine hours of time getting from that 90 foot point to the surface. Um, on ex with utilizing accelerated de decompression model with with um, they were also using uh, uh, rebreathers as well. So let's talk about nine hours to go up ninety feet, right, to get to that point. So they had to have a heated dry suit um, in order to keep their body warm enough to allow the gas to desaturate correctly. So interesting. It, I know exactly which one you're talking about, Chase. Crazy interesting study. Um, really interesting. So definitely be aware that uh, cold does affect how your gas um, off ta off gases as well as on gases. Um, we'll just jump out of that and we'll go over to Dalton. <coughs> and Dalton basically tells us that when we have a mix of different gases like air, each gas pushes on things around it at its own strength. The total partial pressure exerted by a mix of gases equal is equal to the sum. So we under use this to understand the partial pressures of gas in a mix for depth. An example, best blends or mods. I'm, I'm going to put that back up on the screen as well so you guys can see that. I meant to meant to put that up. Uh, window. Da, 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 there we go. Boom. There we go. There we go. So rather than you guys think that I've memorized this, um, I, did, I did rewrite this to try and make it easier for you guys as well so that this is my my dumbing it down hopefully for you guys let's see just gotta find out figure out what page i'm on here let's see uh why can't oh there it is right on there so how do we use these laws this is where we use a boils marriott determine the amount of usable gas in a tank during a dive charles law we use to understand when to stop and let the tank cool while filling a tank gay lessig um the uh, by the way gay lessig was a guy just in, in case you're wondering um, the, the effect of a temperature around us when we get ready to dive, a tank sitting in a hot car or a tank in cold water. Now, Henry's law is perfusion and diffusion of nitrogen in our body during a dive. That's when we use it. We also use it to understand potentially helium. And most recently, there are some studies going on in Hawaii right now with um, nit um, with the uh, Hydrogen as well, but I don't foresee hydrogen ever becoming a real um, opportunity for us any time in the future because, well, there's a there's, there's that whole exploding thing, um, so um, which is definitely a bad thing. Uh, divers at, um, blowing up at depth definitely seems like a bad deal. Now Dalton um, also helps us determine the best blend of a gas for diving and the maximum depth of a gas for a dive. Does that all make sense, guys? Yes. Fantastic. All right. <coughs> so we'll, we're going to kind of round robin these a little bit. Chase Nitrox is used to describe breathing gas made up of an oxygen nitrogen mix with the oxygen percentage higher than 21%. 21% is exact right. Ding, ding, ding. Good job. The percentage of oxygen needed in a gas mixture for a diver to maintain consciousness at sea level is? So this is relief, Caleb. What do you think? Uh, was it 10%? Above 10%? 10% is, is exactly right. And some of these are just knowledge questions so I can get an idea where you guys are at. So see if I need to cover some of this as well. 
but they are questions that you want that will be in your book all right let's see we already covered that covered that oh no we didn't cover that i'm sorry my, my bad all right dalton's law now dalton's law is the basis for motion nitrox calculations the law can be easily represented as a t formula just jump down here now dalton's law of practical application auction is 21 percent nitrogen is 79 percent you guys um tracking with me so far mm -hmm. fantastic 33 feet seawater equals two atmospheres so auction at two atmospheres is 21% uh, times 21% is 42% auction, right? Two atmospheres is 33, three seat, 33 feet seawater. Three atmospheres, 21% auction is equal to 63% auction. And three atmospheres is 66 feet so far. Everybody tracking with me so far? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and nitrogen, two atmospheres, 0.79 times two is 158. Now, a couple of notes. I want you guys to write this down if you wouldn't mind. Auction becomes toxic at 1.6 or above. The working load for auction for safety that I want you guys to just I want, tattoo this on your brain for right now is 1.4. Okay. So as you guys are figuring out best, best blend for auction uh, for your nitrox, 1.4 is your magic number. Now, Joshua, you've heard me talk about this before. Is there a situation where you can use a nitrox blend of 1.6? A nitrox blend of 1.6 or a partial pressure of 1.6? Partial pressure of, of auction of 1.6, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you use it for decompression, don't you? Absolutely. You can do an accelerated decompression of up to 1.6. And that's where that comes into play is um, where we can use 1.6 in accelerated decompression. But when we're just using... A working load, like we're going to go, on, we're going to go dive the the deck of the Lady Luck. We're looking to stay at a partial pressure of auction of 1.4 or less. We also want to make sure nitrogen uh, understand that nitrogen starts becoming narcotic at 2.37, and nitrogen becomes unsafe at 3.95. What that means to you? Nitrogen will become equivalent equal to one martini on empty stomach at 100 feet and increase exponentially thereafter. So it goes to two martinis and four martinis and eight martinis and so on. So you will get more and more NART as time goes by. <coughs> I'm not sure how much more I've got in me, guys, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get you through the best blends, and then we'll call it if that's okay with you all. So Dalton's Law and Practical Application, I'm going to take a quick drink. Oh, would you boil me some water? Yep. And then when it's boiled... Will you fill that much up with my yep. my tea and the rest of the hot water? Perfect. Put my order in for some tea. I've got an amazing wife behind me. So I'm going to use all these in imperial examples. Um, if a diver wishes to make a dive to 115 feet, what is the best mixture for this dive? So simple enough, we take that 115 foot depth and we divide it by 33 feet of seawater. Now, if we do that, we get 3.48. Now, remember, I asked you guys at the beginning of this, to remember, remember, remember to either add or subtract the surface atmosphere. Always, always, always. Don't forget that because it's easy to do. I, I'll admit I've done it once or twice myself. So we get 3.48 plus one to add the surface additional atmosphere equals 4.48 actual atmospheric depth. Now, all we need to do is divide 1.4, which is the working load of partial pressure of oxygen, divided by that 4.48 and it equals out to 31%. Easy enough? Mm -hmm. So, question for you guys. 125 uh, foot depth divided by 33 feet seawater equals 3.79 plus one atmosphere. This was supposed to be a, uh, uh, a question. I wasn't supposed to have the answers, but I think I finished it for the last class, and then I didn't, I didn't re erase the answers. Um, plus one is 4.79, 1.4 equals 4.79 equals 29 percent so 125 foot we can go over to our handy dandy charge which by the way if you go to my your my ssi app in fact um for all of us who accept mike who is on his phone currently would you mind opening up your your handy dandy phone i um whatever device you have go into the my ssi app for it please i've got it too okay cool awesome so if you wouldn't mind go to the my ssi app and you go to the go to the more the three ellipses to the right, and you will notice. Let's see where to go. Where to go? There should be one for charts. 
tables. tables. I'm sorry. There's a little green one for tables. If you click on that, you should be able to scroll down to, there's a combined air EAN. There's a best gas mix table. And you might find, if you go to the English U.S. Imperial version, just make sure you go to the Imperial version, you might bring up this exact chart that I've got on the screen. Has everybody got that? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. I had a question about this and the max operating depth for, for nitrox. Uh -huh. Would you you let's say, um, you know, you, you've got your max operating depth for 32% and then you're diving at altitude. Would, would you use the equivalent depth from the altitude tables? I do. Absolutely. You use a sea level equivalent depth. Absolutely. So it the change. question is, is um, do we use a varied depth for the uh, theoretical depth at altitude? Yes. Um, and, absolutely. Um, there the is debate on this one as well, but in the end, in my mind, it's not a debate at all. You use the theoretical depth instead of the actual depth. So if I was trying to figure out and I realized that um, I uh, was diving a theoretical depth of 120 feet and it was actually 100 feet, which may or may not be like Ryrie Reservoir. So at Ryrie Reservoir, we're diving 22% uh, deeper, so our 100 feet is equal so if i was diving 120 feet the other day at ryrie times 1.21 is equal to 145 foot dive so i would use a blend of 26 percent not a blend of 30 percent thank you that was helpful absolutely um now if you are interested in understanding more about theoretical depths um thank you by the way because that might that gives me a perfect segue to make sure i'm adding my con ed in there um if you are thinking more about understanding diving at altitude, we do teach an altitude diving class. Um, there are some bin specific maths in there that you will not get from anywhere else. I've taken uh, um, the, the Navy dive manual and I've broken it down into um, much simpler to understand. Um, I, I believe it or not, I yes, I read all 782 pages of the US Navy dive manual. Um, it is fantastic and amazing and it will put you to sleep faster than uh, listening to uh, President Biden talk about uh, um, trains in India. So um, hopefully nobody likes Biden. Um, but it is it actually has a lot of amazing information in it. And it was uh, uh, version seven is great. Version eight is even better. Um, but it's impossible to get version eight. <coughs> um, it's just nowhere to be found. The Navy's got to be in a stingy butt on that one, but they're not that much different either. So version seven is available out there on the internet. You can find it at 700 other pages. I actually, this should tell you everything about um, Benjamin the Diver. Here is the Navy dive manual. <laughs> so I have it printed out behind my desk. So, um, and so I can, so if, if you look behind me on my, on my, thing i um interesting manuals that i like to refer back to i actually print out and i like to highlight use highlighters and pencils and stuff like that anyway moral story is, is if you like that kind of stuff i've broken it down and i've got a great course takes about three hours i do have it online if you just want to audit it um or if you want the certification in it i would be happy to certify you in it as well so if you go to teach me to dive um i do have a couple of altitude classes in there that you can audit for free so um or you can get actually certified in it um now, you may ask yourself, Benjamin, why did you certify Nikki in altitude diving? Joshua, that was a great question. Thank you for asking that, by the way. I really appreciate that. Um, the reason I certified Nikki is this. Nikki and I both understand how insurance works. And here's what I understand about insurance is if they have a reason for any reason at all to deny a claim, they absolutely will. So if, for example, Nikki and I happen to be diving in Yellowstone Lake, and there's an air um, an, uh, at altitude of 7,600 el foot elevation or 7,700 foot elevation. Oddly enough, depends on which side of the lake you are on. One side of the lake they claim is 7,600 foot. One side they claim is 77. So just be aware uh, of that. Um, so if we're diving a 7,700 foot elevation and I have an accident, would Dan have a reason to deny a claim? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, would they? I don't know. Um, I I know enough about Dan to know that they are pretty liberal when it comes to 
what they'll do and what they'll cover. Um, they are pretty freaking amazing, but it's one of those things. Do you really want to test to make sure that there's a parachute in your backpack, or would you like to just kind of take a look to make sure there is a parachute in your backpack? I'm just saying, I, I, I'm a big believer and I want to see the parachute. I want to see the ADD, um, automatic deployment device. Um, if you're into um, parachuting, I want to make sure it's set to a thousand feet. You know, I, I like to check a few things as I go along. Same thing with gas. Fun story for you guys. We were diving about a, just about a year and a half ago. Um, there was a hurricane came through Florida. And the only boat we could get on at the end of the hurricane was about an hour south, and it was a recreational boat. And uh, we got on it, and I, I called ahead, and I ordered nitrox, thirty-two uh, percent for both Nick and I. And we get uh, we get there a little early, and we're talking to the dive master, and he's putting our tanks on. He, he says, "Here's your tanks. I got your names on them." And I says, "I need to analyze those." He says, "Why?" And I says, "Because they're nitrox." He says, "Well, why do you want to analyze them?" I says, "Because." They're nitrox. I, I want to know what gas is actually in it so I can program accordingly. He says, but I analyze though. I says, that's great, but I still want to analyze them. He says, you don't trust me? I says, dude, nothing for nothing. I've known you for about 30 seconds. No, I don't trust you. He says, but I'm a retired firefighter. I told him, thank you for your service. I still want to analyze my tanks. He says, but you don't trust me? I says, no. He says, but I'm a retired firefighter. I says, again, thank you for your service, but I still need to see your damn analyzer. He was very butthurt that I we analyzed our own tanks. They went he he very begrudgingly went back to their little shack and got their analyzer and let, he wouldn't let me touch it. And I'm like, dude, if I'm asking you to analyze my tanks, I probably know how to use the damn analyzer. But but I stood right over top of him and watched him physically analyze them. And, and uh, the funny thing is, one of them came out 32 percent. One of them came out 33 percent. One of them came out at 29 percent. One of them came out 31 percent. So there were four tanks of four different. Four different blends and granted we were only doing 60 70 foot dives but it was just interesting it's, you know i trust but verify is what reagan said and I, I live firmly by that belief so um when it comes down to this stuff trust but verify make sure you're analyzing your own tanks make sure you know what's in 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 your backpack at all times because it's in the end who's responsible for your dive joshua you are absolutely by the way i just want to congratulate joshua who just finished his dive master um uh, course, and we're just waiting for SSI to kick in his certification because he's getting ready to start into the assistant instructor. He did a fantastic job, and I'm very proud of Joshua for passing his dive master. He has done a fantastic Woo! job. I'm very proud of him. Um, and I'm hoping to see Brian, Caleb, and Chase make it to that level just as quickly and um, and easily as Josh did because they're amazing as well. So anyway, going back to our little chart here. What's the time to be? Uh, how long did it take you, Josh? You were one of the fastest. Uh, I got certified mid-April and then took a month off. So, so April to September, so five months. Yeah, but you so can probably beat it because I was in Europe for a month. I got certified in 1998, so I may have missed the mark. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <coughs> But we'll start your we'll we'll start your time as as uh, with your daughter's certification. So. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Oh, that's so much better. Woo. Now, now, so we've got this. Uh, we're back over to our chart. 125 foot depth. Uh, 35, 33 feet seawater. We gave up a 3.79. We added our surface temperature, surface atmosphere. I mean, 4.79. We came up with 29 percent nitrox. Uh, that's what we're going to do. Now, how will this affect your nitrogen exposure, Mike? Sorry, I was eating. It'll, um, if your oxygen is lower, it will increase your nitrogen exposure. But in this case, your oxygen is going to be higher. You're going to be um, uh, 8% higher than uh, ambient. So you're going to have less nitrogen exposure. So your equivalent nar narcotic depth is going to be lower uh, in this case. I thought you said it was uh, your oxygen percent was lower at 29. Is that not? Well, you remember uh, surface at, um, atmospheric pressure for oxygen is going to be 21%. So we're using 29% in this case. So we're 8% higher. So which means we're 8% less nitrogen in, in in overall course. So we're, we're absorbing 8% less nitrogen by breathing 29% nitrox versus 21% oxygen. Or 20%, 20 percent air. So what that's going to do is it's going to reduce our equivalent narcotic depth. So we can actually go deeper. 
and still have the same equivalent narcotic depth, right? So the idea at 21% our equivalent narcotic depth that we need to worry about is 66 feet. This gives at 29% ni uh, nitrox will give us to uh, 82 feet equivalent narcotic depth. So an 82 foot dive will be the same as a 66 foot narcotic depth dive. So we don't have to worry about nitro narcosis um, as much. We can go a little deeper and not have to worry about nitro narcosis quite as much. And just something yeah, I want I you guys to kind of get in your mind now and start understanding. But this is the basic formula. It's literally the depth divided by feet seawater equals out your basic atmospheric pressure plus one for your surface equals your actual atmospheric depth. Now, get out your calculators, guys. Let's get our, our little thinking caps on, and let's go ahead and I'm going to take this off so you guys can't cheat. So if I was going to do a dive to 115 feet, hopefully you guys have put all put your, your the charts away that I showed you how to cheat on away. If I'm going to do a 115-foot dive, what is the best blend of nitrox? That would be 100 and what? 115 feet. And I want the, I would like not only the best nitrogen blend, but I want it in uh, points. So, you know, 31.792, uh, 29.225, whatever it is. I want you to give me the, the full, just to prove that you did the math. got it for me i got it jace what is it i've got 31 uh, 31.21 etc okay perfect that's a good job how about 107 feet what's my best blend for 107 feet Chase, what is it, Chase? Uh, 33% even. That's exactly right. All right, Chase, you're excluded from the next two question, questions. <laughs> well, I, but I got to sneeze. <sighs> Bless you. Ah, thank you, guys. Sorry about that. All right. Again, remote learning, preventing COVID since 2021, right? Okay. <laughs> um, how about 127 feet? And Chase, you don't get to play. Twenty-eight. Nine. 28.9%. 28.8%. I agree. Okay. Next one. 112 feet. Thirty-one point eight. Okay, and one more just for fun. One hundred and fifty feet. One hundred and fifty feet. 
Five point two or five nine. I just have to do like two nine. I agree. Twenty five point two. Don't give me the students the answer. I didn't. I'm just saying I have the best calculator. <laughs> Which um, did you have the formula up? Because I didn't see that in the in the material, but I've been using an app, and I I can't get the like the exact. Oh, percent, I can. But. Yeah, I tell you, the my favorite the app is a one called I don't know how to pronounce it. So that's all he's asking, sweetheart. So the the um, formula is I'll just write it in here. Depth divided by feet seawater or feet fresh water equals ATA plus one right but once you have that then it's simply enough 1.4 which is your uh working partial pressure of oxygen divided by ata at depth that's your whole formula right there and as you guys can see it's it was pretty crazy easy isn't it mm -hmm. so it's the first thing that after 187 feet salt water, you start getting into hypoxic mixes? Um, you should. <coughs> um, after 150 feet, you should you should get in, be getting into hypoxic mixes, um, simply for the fact you're getting into a high um, narcotic depth. Um, you're going to um, start getting into, because if you're at 150 feet, how many atmospheres is that? Six. Five point five four. Yeah, that's like five. Yeah. So say five point five times point seven nine. You're at four hundred thirty four percent nitrogen. So you're definitely up there in in nitrogen load. Remember earlier we talked about. Uh, let's see. Let me just check on the slide. I'm on real quick. He said it was unsafe at three point nine five. Yep. So you're you're. At 150 feet, you are definitely getting into nitrogen narcosis. No so you, you'd have to mind. go trimix, right? You'd have to go to trimix to balance out both the yeah. oxygen partial pressure and the nitrogen partial pressure. Yes. Okay. Now, while I do teach an, an air course, um, a nitrox air course, uh, 250 feet, um, it is the max permissible by any agency. And the funny thing is that course used to be 175 feet. Oh, um, uh, most of the agencies had their extended range at 175 feet. So when I first got certified in this course, it meant that I was good on a nitrogen blend, a nitrox blend, 275 feet. we lose Ben? Yeah, I think we lost him again. He's having a night. Mm. His internet's not the best. He says, I'll be back.
but they don't usually. They're pretty good. Guys, thank you so much. <coughs> All right. All right. So anyway, what I was saying is, so when I first got certified to extended range in uh, extended range my trucks, um, the certification was 175 feet. And the RSTC about 18, 19 months ago um, came back and they said, wait a minute, this is not safe. We want everybody to pull back to 150 feet. The anticipation is that in the next three to six months, the R RSTC is going to make another shift in arrangement. Um, TDI right now is, and GUI are both pushing very heavily for this, that they're going to shift the XR course to 130 feet. Um, really? the deepest air that you can do is 130 feet. Um, and that, uh, everything after 130 feet will go to trimix. So that's, that's the kind of the general direction that we're seeing, um, from this. And it's completely understandable when you start understanding equivalent narcotic depth. Um, and, uh, it's as time goes by and, and you'll hear the old timers say, I did 200 foot air dives all the dang time. Yes, you probably did. You're an idiot. Um, and it's wonder you're still alive. Um, I, I usually call those the Darwin divers, right? Because Darwin will catch up with them at some point. Um, so a little safety certainly goes a long way. And do we put too much safety on it? That's a whole different discussion for a whole different time. But for now, we'll just leave it to say that um, the, the standard is moving and increasing safety as we go along. Um, GUI already is at the point that Tech One starts teaching trimix at 100 feet. So um, a shallow level trimix, definitely to your advantage. Um, it makes for a safer dive. Um, it uh, uh, reduces the chances of nitrogen narcosis and nitrogen uh, nitrogen issues as well. So just be aware, that definitely is something to be aware of. Now, Can you get trimix around here? here? Uh, good luck on that. Uh, night, uh, helium is next to impossible to get right now, unless you're on the coast. And even then it's tricky. Um, so, um, the closest place to get Trimix, you, um, you can get it in Draper, um, at, uh, dive addicts. Um, but they are pretty stingy with it too, because they have a hard time getting, um, breathe, uh, uh, medical grade, uh, helium, which is your key. Um, you can certainly get helium, um, for balloons, but that you do not want to breathe helium um, made for balloons because the amount of um, other crap that's in that is just unbelievable. So um, if you need that formula, here it is right here. I'll let you copy that down should you need that. Um, I know somebody had asked for that. Anybody, everybody need, anybody else need this slide up anymore? I'm good. Thanks. All right. All right. So now... The great thing is, is Dalton's law kicks over to maximum operating depth as well. Now, you'll find this exact chart in your My SSI app as well. Now, I want to really stress in again, 1.4 is the maximum partial pressure for a working load. So if you're doing a working load, that means you're diving. You're diving to the deck of the uh, the Lady Luck or um, to the HMS-1 or whatever. You're, you're doing a fun dive, right? Um, that's the level that you want to stand under. You can go to 1.6 for short periods of time or for accelerated decompression. We'll go over a lot more accelerated decompression should you continue on to my deco procedures or extended rain course. So we go a, a lot into accelerated decompression for understanding. Now, 1.4 divided by the partial pressure in the cylinder, minus one. Why do we minus one, guys? Count for the atmosphere. Absolutely. Because we're you all are going to get next time I see you guys, you'll have been to the tattoo parlor and have a uh, tattoo across your forehead. Don't forget the surface level atmospheric pressure of minus or plus one. So simple enough. If a diver wants to know how deep he can dive on a forty percent blend of nitrox, simple enough. One point four divided by forty percent equals three point five. Three point five minus one equals two point five. That's our new actual atmospheric depth. 2.5 times 33 is equal to 82 and a half feet. Let's check it. So we come over here at 1.4. You guys see it? The last one right here. 40%, 82 and a half. We rounded up to 83 for safety. It's right there. Simple enough. There is a nice chart on this. So 1.4. 
let's see. I'm going to kick this off. Now, utilizing that math of the partial pressure divided by the mix in the tank, minus 1 multiplied by 33. You guys got it? If I wanted to do, uh, or I'm sorry, I take that back. If I got a, a blend of nitrox from the uh from the dive shop at 33%, what is my maximum operating depth at 1.4? 33%. Chase, what is it? 107. Exactly. What if I got a, okay, Chase is excluded. Brian, your question is 36%. What's my maximum operating depth for 36% nitrox? 36%. One second. I'm, yep, one second. I'm getting 0.3 feet. You're getting how deep? 95.3 feet. You said 33. 95.3. Yeah, I'm 5.3. Three. Oh, nine five. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. <coughs> Apparently, I can't talk and I'm deaf too. All right. Good job. 95 feet is exactly right. Um, Joshua, 28%. What is my maximum operating depth for 20? 132. 132 is exactly right. You've got the chart up, don't you? No. Nope. Mike? He just has the same cool calculator I do. And Mike will give you 37%. I already did 37%. I'm sorry. Uh, 27%. Right, give me a second. 143.45. 138, right? So, so overall, is the, are the calculations that complicated, guys? Yeah. Is it really worth spending nine ninety nine on a stupid app for your phone? Yes. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not, right? <laughs> the funny thing is, is, I can't tell you the last time I used, well, I can tell you exactly the last time I used a chart was the last time I taught a class. Um, Nikki will tell you every time we've dove together, I pull out my calculator and I do the math right then and there. Um, if I know the next day we're going out on dive and I know the depth, what we're going to do, I usually do a five plus five and figure out uh, what happens if I go five feet deeper than what I think. And uh, I do the math and, and I order up our nitrox based upon that to give myself some leeway at 1.4, which gives us a little bit more, a little extra leeway. Um, and Nikki would say when we do our mods, I pull out my calculator. I've never, Nikki, have you ever seen me pull out a chart? No. Because the math is easy. <laughs> it's not rocket science. Right, and that's the key is is just memorize this math. It it's not hard. It's pretty basic stuff. All right, guys, we covered a lot um, overall. What questions do you guys have at this point? Jace, I see the wheels are turning. Yeah, and I'm coming up with nothing. Well, good, good. I I I see the. Uh, the picture of the submarine behind you that went out with a hundred men and 50 couples. Yep. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, what questions do you have? You've been through this class of, or my classes a few times. So yeah, I know you covered everything pretty good. Caleb, what questions do you have? I got to go put all these uh, formulas into a one little cheat sheet in my note app. There you go. The great thing is, is it's really, if you look at it, it's the same formula. It's just solving yeah. for X or solving for Y. It really is the same formula. It's definitely not, the only number you need to remember is 1.4 and either minus one or plus one. If you can remember those two things, the rest is easy. Mike, we haven't, you haven't taken class from me before. Um, what do you think? What do you need? So far, so good. I think you, you answered the kind of the main question I had, which was related to the how this it, how these numbers are impacted by altitude. And it sounds like you just used that uh, equivalent. You're right with that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's and it, that was a, a very astute question as well. And it's one that I asked when I took this class as well. Brian, what questions do you have? So the only one I kind of have would be 
Um, I know, you know, 1.4 is kind of the guideline. Um, if somebody was extremely safety conscious, have you ever heard of anybody just using 1.3 to be even that much more safe? Absolutely. The more common number is 1.1. Um, okay. And where you see that happen the most is when you see people going into decompression diving with a rebreather because they're doing a lot longer dives and they're uh, a lot more concerned at that point for oxygen toxicity, uh, both pulmonary and uh, central nervous system style. So um, it's, it's not uncommon um, to see that it, or in older people. I've, I've seen uh, certain cave divers. He looks like he's lost in thought. What's that famous statue, the thinker? <laughs> you have to take a screenshot of that and call him yeah. you know, the diving thinker. Right. He is a Marine, so I assume that when he thinks this hard, things freeze up. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna grab that all right i got a screen capture of it <laughs> he's gonna edit that out for youtube tomorrow yep <laughs> he said brb this time so i'm not getting the whole sentence i'm only getting three letters <laughs> There we go. I am back. I have returned. That this is the result of me going and buying the nicest, most expensive router at uh, at Best Buy. I bought a five hundred dollar freaking router, um, wireless router, and uh, was told by the uh, uh, Sparklight that um, it has issues. So <laughs> you only spent five hundred dollars on your networking setup, Ben. I know, right? Dude, That's amateur hour. <laughs> my ac one of my access points cost more than that. Yes, but. You're a little bit more into it than I am, I'm sure. <laughs> but you got to admit, 500 bucks for a router is above and beyond the most. But uh, anyway, the moral story was, is um, Brian, that was a great question. Um, and what you'll see is people who are concerned about that, they generally tend to be older or a lot more conservative. They'll use a 1.1 set point um, or partial pressure as their guide point. Um, and in those some of those cases as well, um, they'll dive an air table instead of a nitrox table, um, which will add additional safety levels as well. So that's generally where you see, I'm not like that. Um, I don't, I want to know exactly where the edge is. And when I'm getting closer to it, I don't want it to be a, a gray zone that, am I getting close to the edge? Maybe I'm close to the edge. I know I've got a 30% safety margin, but what does that work out to? Because I realize while I'm diving um, and I'm going into a deco point that the brain functions don't work as well. It's one of the things that um, you guys will have a little bit of fun when we do our deep dive uh, class on Sun or Saturday is that, uh, um, Mike, unfortunately, um, Caleb, uh, Chase, and Brian are all in a deep dive class with me on Saturday. And so one of the games awesome. I play is I, I have a, 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 um, a slate with math. Uh, I've got uh, four math pro or eight math problems on them that are one plus one, two plus six. You know, they're simple math problems. And I have them do it at the surface and I have them do it at depth. And the idea is, is um, yes, they'll have a little bit of nitronarcosis going along. Um, and during this dive, and it's going to slow them down. But pressure, depth, uh, or pressure, um, cold, and uh, lack of uh, visibility, lack of light, a lot, all these factors come together and reduce cognitive function considerably. The average uh, person to finish my eight question uh, addition uh, challenge uh, is usually between 50 seconds and uh, a minute and a half, uh, typically. It usually takes about 10 seconds to do it on the surface about a minute to do it at depth. So 
cognitive function is reduced dramatically due to extenuating circumstances like cold, like narcosis, um, like visibility, um, uh, like lack of light. Um, uh, all these factors definitely kick in to reduce mental function. So I realized that, that as we start dealing with reduced cognitive function, that do I really want to have to think about doing more difficult math to know that I'm safe? I would rather just set the points and say, okay, here's the edge. If I want, and I start feeling uh, problems that I know that I'm closing on the edge, I just call it and, and we'll head up, right? And be aware of that. And so I'm, I'd rather have accurate numbers and make my judgment based upon accuracy rather than, you know, a built-in bullshit safety margin that I, I, I added to it. So that's my thing, right? Um, each person, you do you. Yes, sir, Jace, I saw that. I, I was going to let you finish, but I, I did come up with a question that goes back to something we talked about earlier. Um, regarding uh, uh, saturation of, of different tissue compartments, um, I, I had heard somewhere that that if you're going to dive with helium mixture or trimix, you always do your helium mixture before you switch over to nitrox, say during your decompression. Um, well, yeah, you you wouldn't you wouldn't do a decompression mix with uh, with a helium in it because it wouldn't it doesn't work as well. Um, plus, it's a big waste. At that point, there's no point in having helium in the mix because as you get to that point where you're using oxygen, you're going to want to use a higher blend of oxygen, and the nitrogen doesn't matter as much, right? Okay. At that point, yeah. it's a non it's a non binding uh, compound, and so um, uh, typically my my decompression blends start at 55 60. Uh, I'll either use a 55 percent or a 60 percent, and then my second blend is either 90 percent or 100 percent. So those are the two my most common decompression blends that I use. Um, overall. So there's at that point, if I'm using a, say a 60%, that's only 40% um, nitrogen. Why would I bother having helium in there? Okay. Because at, at six, at uh, 60%, I mean, you got to realize, I mean, what's my maximum depth? What's my mod actually guys, okay, you get the math problem. What's my mod for 60% nitrox? <coughs> now I can use 1.6, by the way, 44 at 1.4. If you want yep. 1.6, it's 55. Yep, yeah. exactly. So 55 feet, am I concerned about nitrogen narcosis at all, even if I was just diving air? No. No, absolutely no. not. But at that point, at 55 feet, I've reduced the amount of nitrogen that's so much with a 60% blend that it's not even an issue at that point either, right? Okay. So it's I'm only breathing, if I'm breathing 40%, Nitro or nitrogen that's times three, um, so at 66 feet. So I'm only breathing 1.2 percent or 1.2, 120% nitrogen, so it's not an issue okay. either. So, why would I want why would I waste um helium that's going to cost me um, what is it that uh, I think it's 12 or 14 dollars a pound right now? So, or a cubic, I'm sorry, not a pound, a cubic foot. I'm, I'm sorry, it's 14, I think it's 14 bucks a cubic foot right now. So that sounds like a deal for a pound. Yeah, it might be better if they bill you by the pound. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a cubic foot right now. So 80 cubic foot tank is going to be pretty expensive. But um, it, it, your gas, that's the funny thing. Now, when you guys get to, ready to do Trimix and you guys come out to Florida uh, with me, just realize the course will be the cheaper part of what you'll do with me. Uh, paying for Because when you do a Trimix course, you pay for your own gas as well. The gas yeah. bill will be more than the, the course and the dives. Just, really? just be aware. You'll um, for a week week of trimix diving. You'll probably you'll probably spend about fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred bucks on on helium. Oh, oh so just be aware. It's um, it's not uncommon for people to get their gas bill from trimix and go oh, and have a little bit of a coronary. So <coughs> take some Zoloft and then, then order your trimix. <laughs> invest, invest in the rebreather. Invest in a rebreather because it's substantially cheaper. Um, yep. Yeah, really, three cubic feet of, uh, of of helium versus a lot more. Yeah, it's going to be substantially less. But overall, that's the, that moral story. So we went through a lot tonight. Um, we've and I've touched on some topics that are a little bit bigger than a typical science of diving, and um, I did that for this class because you guys are more interested in the subject and a little bit farther along on the scale. So I hope I didn't uh, take you too far into the deep end of the pool. Um, but this is kind of the taste of what um, intro to tech looks like as well. So my problem with basic science of diving taught by 99% of instructors out there is they talk a lot about the what's 
and never about the whys because most science and diving instructors aren't tech instructors as well. And that's what I had a hard time. When I went through science of diving, I went through something that gave me all the what's, but they didn't give me the why's. And for me, if you can't give me a why, I don't give a shit, to be honest with you. I don't mean to be crass on that at all, but I have to understand the why behind something before I want to know it and, and keep and retain that information. So I've tried to give you the why's behind everything um, and how that applies and where that goes from here. So hopefully you guys felt that. You guys feel like you got a pretty good, good. That yep. was that's our goal. So you guys are far more prepared for intro to tech um, than you than uh, if you'd gone to another instructor, I think. Um, and uh, that's where I'm trying to take you guys as well is give you that that good understanding. So when you guys go to the next step, you're ready for it. Now, what questions do you guys have? Any more? Those are good questions. You guys are doing great. Nothing here. All right. Well, cool. Well, we covered a lot. We covered uh, absolute pressure, atmospheric pressure, <coughs> and gauge pressure as well. Um, we went through those and gave you a pretty good understanding. Um, as as we talk about, Mike, you haven't heard this spiel yet, but just be aware in your books, I will only cover about half of what is in the Science of Diving book. The other half, you are just as capable of reading it and understanding as I am of reading it to you. Um, I don't tell bedtime stories and I don't do Mother mother Goose. I'm sorry. If you need that, you need to go to a different instructor um, because that stuff is well below where you guys are at. Now, on that same note, though, 50% of what I will teach you will not be in the book. So please take notes. If you need my uh, my pegs, I'm happy to send them to you. At the end of this course, I will send you a um, abbreviated set of my pegs that will have all the formulas in them um, and uh uh, and key notes that I felt were important from this course. So at the end of this, you'll have a, um, a, a PDF set, because I set up a PDF that will have all the formulas for best mix, uh, mod, as well as equivalent narcotic depth, um, and a few other key things that I think are interesting and, and worthwhile. Um, I'll also make sure that I, I give you in there the, the, the laws simply stated and their uses. Um, so you understand why Boyle, Marriott, Charles, Gay, Lussick, Henry, and Dalton are important and where where you might use them and see them. Um, so you don't have to re remember that. You get a uh, simple set of set of notes. Um, and I'll also uh, put some stuff in there about Henry's as well. Um, I'll also put in the SACRA calculations and we'll get that get to that as well. Um, other than that, guys, what quite any more questions? Here's one quick one. You, you're talking about the intro to tech. Is that um, part of the SSI? I was looking at the like the different classes. Is it extended range or is it a different? Deco procedures is really what it is. Um, gotcha. I call I I, I call a, a deco procedures intro to tech. Um, there now there is a tech fundies class. Don't get it confused with that because tech fundies with SSI and SDI is basically four hours of pool time, getting people comfortable in position and gear. Um, and the way I use uh, uh, tech fundies is when I have a student that is newer to, to diving and wants to get into tech and I can't just get them to relax and just dive and they're determined to go to tech. And so I take them into a tech fundies class because it's a minimum of four hours underwater in a pool learning trim and buoyancy. <laughs> because before I take somebody out in the end of the open water to, and I want them switching cylinders, I want them to be able to handle holding cylinders and be able to do basic skills. Because here's how I use open water guys is open water for me is evaluation of skills. Um, and uh, confined water is teaching of skills. So that's, that's generally how I use it. Um, especially when we get into tech, because when we start uh, manipulating and using more advanced setups, I really need to make sure that you're not going to go out and drown. Um, drowning students is usually hit, uh, frowned upon. Just kidding. I, I haven't drowned a student yet. I've had a few emergencies that I've had to deal with, but nothing big <laughs> that I couldn't handle. <laughs> so what you're saying is don't put 40 pounds of weight inside my dry suit that I'm untrained for. <laughs> Fair enough. I did. Uh, there is another instructor here uh, about 15 miles away that put a diver in a wetsuit in 45 pounds of lead. Jesus. In a BC that had a lift capacity of 20 pounds. I was like, are you, I, I won't say what I was thinking, but the, the diver called me the next day in a panic and freaking out. And I, I told him, I says, that's criminal. I finally, I couldn't hold it, hold my, my uh, butter anymore and 
told him that was a criminal act. And would he please come out um, the, the next day to my next open water class and let me have one of my uh, instructors work with him? We got him down to 18 pounds, and I think that was heavy. I think he needed to be 16. But they they literally, this instructor put him in 45 pounds of lead in a wetsuit in the right, in, in fresh water. I was like, are you freaking kidding me, dude? As an instructor, do you have a mechanism for reporting things like that to SSI that are that are concerns like that? We do, but the the litmus that it has to rise to for me to put a formal report in and, and cause the the ocean the wave of shit that is evolved with that um, has yeah. to rise pretty high. Okay. Um, that one didn't didn't quite rise to the level of wanting to put myself through the shit. I was able to to yeah. get the student, fix the student, and get them corrected so that they wouldn't go out there and do it on their own. So I was able to fix the situation. And next time I see that instructor, well, I'm going to have a conversation with him, to be honest with you. I just haven't had a chance yet. But uh, No, no I, I get it. I was just curious if SSI. There he is. And, form of um, I work hard not to do reporting, um, yeah. but I'm coming pretty close on this instructor to giving the, uh, to doing a full report on them but and going through the wave of shit to do that. So. Yeah. I just don't like to. I'm not that guy that wants to, you know, uh, if I could fix the situation and prevent that, I will. So at the same time, if you can keep somebody from drowning because it gets that egregious, it's nice to know that there is an avenue for pursuing that. There absolutely is. Absolutely. And they've come close to that level for me a couple of times. So okay. anyway, that's that's what I've got for you guys tonight. I will send out invites um, for our okay. next classes. I just haven't copied the emails across and invited yet. Um, I'll probably do that in the morning if that'd be okay with you guys. Yep. Yeah. You think you're going to be yep. feeling good enough to do the deep dives on uh, Saturday? Absolutely. Um, I did a, I drank an entire thing of V8 today um, just so I could feel better. And uh, I will do the same thing tomorrow. That's 7,000% okay. of the data recommended about a vitamin C. I'm diving Saturday, damn it. <laughs> no, that was a huge last Saturday, which you probably shouldn't have been either. Yeah, Saturday I was sick too, but I was like, I promised I was going to be out there, so I dove anyway. <laughs> <laughs> my sol but you love my solution because I knew I had a sore throat and I was congested. I took some Sudafed and done a full face mask. <laughs> there you go. That way I could cough because I, I was coughing. So it's easier to cough at a full face mask than it is at a regulator. So I, wrote, I just pushed over a full face mask so I could, I could dive still. <laughs> yeah, I'm There's a solution for everything. If you're look if you're willing to look for it. <laughs> yeah. It takes a lot to keep me from diving. <laughs> so I had no, I had no uh, uh, sinus issues at all with my dive. I did, I did just fine. Just it was nice to have the full face mask. I could cough once in a while, and I didn't have to yeah. I didn't sweat it too much. <clears throat> but yes, I will be diving on Saturday, um, and I'll be well. Um, I've got Nikki put emergency in my my little uh, hot tea thing. So, and I'll do another thing of V8 tomorrow, and I'll be right as rain by by Friday. Okay. Easy enough. Cool, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you very All right, much. Guys. Yep. All right. All right. Thank you.